matter what hour your clock strikes here, it's always Halloween. And I'm always your haunted host, Luce Tomlin Brenner. Welcome to our very first crossover episode. This is a blend between the Grindhouse Institute and It's Always Halloween. I sat down with my friends, Brian Foster and Jeremy Floyd, whom I know through Videotech, the video store that I work at part-time when I'm not making the podcast, and they are such die-hard film enthusiasts. Their passion is infectious. I love talking about movies with them. So when they said that they wanted to have me on Grindhouse to talk about Stephen King movies, I knew it had to be a crossover episode. I was like, guys, we're actually doing a whole Stephen King month on our Patreon. I have a ton of eek mails from my lanterns gushing about Stephen King. They were absolutely thrilled to hear that. And so today, you're going to hear a mashup of our two podcasts. First, together, we are going to dig into the Drew Barrymore double feature of Firestarter from 1984 and Cat's Eye, a horror anthology from 1985. After our deep dive and analysis of these two films, we're reading eek mails from Lanterns who are obsessed with Stephen King. Now, if you're concerned because you've never seen these movies before, hey, guess what? This Sunday, we're doing a double feature on our Patreon of Firestarter and Cat's Eye. So you can hang tight Join us for the double feature and then listen to the episode, or you can listen to the episode and then watch with us, or do your own double feature if you can't make it on Sunday. These two films are extremely Halloween-y for me, especially Cat's Eye. That's a movie that's on my watch list every year. I've already started my spooky playlist at Videotech, and I've already played Cat's Eye for the customers who come in. So I... Do think that this should be on your watch list no matter what. Now, for those of you who like cozier, spooky movies and don't like to get any into anything that's too intense, Cat's Eye is PG-13 and Firestarter is rated R. And both films, while creepy and dark and suspenseful, don't feature anything too violent or bloody and are mostly, in my mind, fun, campy, enjoyable Halloween watch movies. In fact, we get into this on the episode, but Firestarter was a huge inspiration for Stranger Things. So if you're like me, a giant Stranger Things fan, then you really owe it to yourself to dive into Firestarter. The book is incredible, much stronger than the film. And that's not always the case, but in this case, the book is just extraordinary. But the film, it's actually a pretty strong adaptation. So if you are curious about these movies, they are two of the lesser known, lesser talked about Stephen King adaptations. You must listen to this episode and please join us this Sunday, that is September 11th, for our Drew Barrymore double feature. It's going to kick off at 4 p.m. with a special curated Stephen King pre-show. And of course, every single movie party that we host is also accompanied with my own research and film critical analysis, as well as the chat for you and the others in the Ghoul Gang to laugh and joke around and discuss the film as we're watching. Now, that is not all. This month, I'm actually doing three Stephen King double features. On his birthday, September 21st, I'll be screening both creep show movies. Again, these films, these horror anthologies, based on Stephen King's stories directed by George Romero of the Night of the Living Dead films. These movies are pure Halloween to me, and they're on my Halloween watch list every year. 
Again, they're really playful. They are based on horror comics. You know, they have that campy Tales from the Crypt vibe to them. So they're not too messed up or disturbing. So I'm excited to be double featuring those on his birthday, Wednesday, September 21st. And then I'm also doing an all ghoul gang screening of Carrie, two Carries, the Brian De Palma version and the Kimberly Pierce version. And that's going to be on Saturday, September 24th. Another exciting announcement is that Nathan and I are co-hosting our first Lantern Halloween party. Everyone who can make it to LA is welcome. There I'll be screening the Carrie films, which will also screen virtually for all Ghoul Gang members. So even if you're not at the movie party level, as a thank you and a celebration for Calendar Halloween, I will be screening this for all Ghoul Gang members. And if you're in person, we'll be doing a Halloween gift exchange and potluck. So mark your calendars for Saturday, September 24th, and email it's always Halloween podcast at gmail.com to RSVP if you want to join us in person for our first Halloween party. And if you love Carrie as much as I do, then you have to join us for Book Club this month because we're reading Carrie, Stephen King's very first novel. And I'm anticipating a really stimulating discussion about the film adaptations and the book and what the takeaway is between all these different ways to tell a story. Book Club will be meeting on the last Tuesday of the month, as it does every month. That's September 27th at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. We meet virtually, so you can come from anywhere in the world. We even have Ghoul Gang members in Europe who stay up and join us, which just warms my Halloween heart. And then the last thing I want to tell you about that we're doing on Patreon is baking Grimturn Nathan's favorite Halloween sweet pumpkin rolls. Now his original recipe will be featured in our upcoming Halloween that we're making in collaboration with Joe Carlo from Displaced Snail. But for Kitchen Witch this month, we are baking the vegan version. Both versions, vegan and dairy, are up on our Patreon now and you can bake whichever version tickles your fancy. Now, if you want to bake along with us and see me covered in ingredients like a feisty little toddler, then you should tune in to our Instagram at It's Always Halloween Podcast this upcoming Tuesday, September 13th, and see us make these pumpkin rolls together. Me and Nathan in his kitchen baking pumpkin rolls. I've never baked this before. I'm extremely intimidated. It'll all be on Instagram Live starting at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So regardless of if you're in the ghoul gang or not, you can tune in on Instagram and uh, we can kind of joke around and <laughs> and talk about baking, something that I am not very strong at. But you guys know I love to learn, I'm very open-minded, and I don't mind being humbled by an intimidating recipe. So that's our Stephen King September on Patreon. We're reading Carrie. We're watching Carrie. We're watching a ton of other Stephen King adaptations. We are baking pumpkin rolls. Not technically Stephen King, but I'm going to go out on a limb and say the man loves a pumpkin roll. Plus, I'll be reading a couple of Stephen King short stories for bonus episodes. And let's not forget the Halloween blog and our community Discord, where all the cool ghouls gather to discuss every spooky thing in the world 24 hours a day. Oh, it's lit like a Samhain bonfire over there. So come and join us at patreon.com slash it's always Halloween or click that Patreon link in our show notes. We truly would not be able to make this podcast without you ghouls. You are responsible for producing every single episode of It's Always Halloween. So thank you for all your support and a big hearty Halloween welcome to our newest ghouls, Victoria, Veronica, Cassie, Robert, Lindsay, Jennifer, Adrian, Lietra, Benny, Kelly, Mitch, Maria, and Jasmine. 
another heaping Halloween thank you ghouls. Please join us at patreon.com slash it's always Halloween or click that Patreon link in our show notes. Now we are just about ready to get into our Grindhouse Institute. It's always Halloween mashup. I just have a quick note about this episode before we get started. As I said, Cat's Eye is PG-13, Firestarter is rated R. In this episode, we will be using language that reflects those MPAA ratings. I know we have lanterns of all ages out there, and this will continue to be an all-ages show. That being said, if you are a listener or you listen with someone who would prefer to not hear PG-13 and up language, then this might be a good episode to either pre-screen or skip. That being said, we will continue with our typical all-ages shows going forward. Now grab some popcorn and turn out the lights because we are about to dive deep into Cat's Eye and Firestarter. Listen to me carefully. It's still looking for me. You've got to get back and find it. You are my only chance. You are my only chance. Why don't you come up with me at least? It doesn't work that way. Against the rules. What is this, a quit smoking clinic or the CIA? <laughs> Who are they? Government agents. FBI? No, the shop. The shop? Yes. Yeah, really the Department of Scientific Intelligence, DSI. My daughter, Charlene, and I, Charlie, we were part of an experiment. Happened a long time ago. <gasps> They're coming. They're coming for us. There's a line of cars coming up the road. I'll stand with you if you want. I'll get my deer gun. You don't need your gun. All right, welcome back to the Grindhouse Institute. I am Brian Foster, and with me as always is Jeremy Floyd. Hello, and how are you? Hey, it's for horses, sometimes for cows, but pigs don't eat it because they don't know how. Bundle! When Ducky says that, it means shut up. Does it? Yeah. It's like a joke, you know? <laughs> I, I, we need to g- probably go over the lines that you pick, uh, just so I can have a response <laughs> to some of these prior to recording, uh, prior to going yeah. live here. Today we're going right. to be talking, uh, <laughs> the name of this episode, at least the one that we're working with right now, is Barrymore a la King, which yeah. I think is just a, a great, great title. <laughs> We're talking two films that were both Stephen King. Well, one of them is an actual Stephen King adaptation. Another one is adaptations Uh of Stephen King short stories, I believe is the way to put that. Uh, We're talking Firestarter from 1984 and Cat's Eye from 1985. Back to back, Drew Barrymore and Stephen King. Pretty nice. I'm glad we've we've got some more Stephen King in here. I don't think we've had any yet. We did The Shining, but he won't consider that. That's uh, not. Yeah, that was Stanley Kubrick's (laughs) The Shining, I believe. Yeah. 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 (laughs) And to talk about these amazing 80s films with us today, we have a special guest. Jeremy, would you please do the introduction? Absolutely. Uh, So we're bringing uh, some video store classics here and, uh, you know, movies from the 80s. And who better to bring on than filmmaker, cinephile, and the host of It's Always Halloween podcast, Luce Tomlin Brenner. Welcome. Hello. It's so great to be here. Great to have you. Thank you. On. This is quite a block Absolutely. we've got for you here. Um, was was this was this your choice, or did, did Jeremy pitch this one to you, or how, how did this one work out? I actually don't remember because I do love both of these films. Was it like <laughs> a back and forth that we had? Yeah, I, I think we were just kind of yeah batting around some ideas, and this kind of turned into turned into an episode. Yeah, I mean, a double Drew is brilliant. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I have to I have to admit something. This is the first time I've seen Firestarter. All the way through. Really? I mean, okay. I had seen probably the whole thing in clip form at various times uh, on <laughs> TV, etc. Cat's Eye. I'm an anthology horror film nerd, so this is another yeah. one that I had in my you know the docket that I would always watch. Um, obviously, it has nothing on Creep Show, but it's still one of those real fun <laughs> ones. Um, but yeah, I'd love to just uh, start getting into this. Or Lucy. Luce, sorry. Could you give us no, a little okay. background on what, what what you do or, or yeah, why you're such a cinephile? Yeah. 
Um, so I grew up with parents who are cinephiles and huge Stephen King fans. In fact, oh, nice. from as long as I can remember, my mom always had a Stephen King book on her nightstand <laughs> or in her purse. Awesome. And so, the, so your mom was was the mom from the the troll episode of yes. uh, of, of Cat's Eye. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Perfect. I know. I love when she's just laying in bed reading that giant <laughs> hardcover book. Yeah. Yes, and the first one I remember was Pet Cemetery. The cover with the yeah. cat yeah. kind of oh like God. screaming yeah. on the cover, and I just remember looking through her work bag and finding it and being like, ah! <laughs> like <laughs> a good lesson to not go through your parents' stuff. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and that book specifically, it would like be in the, the bedroom way. and then it would be in the kitchen and it would just like always be somewhere. And I was like, oh, I'd like flip the cover over because I didn't want to <laughs> see it. But at the same time, his stuff just was so intriguing you right. know, like I was just so curious about it. And like Cat's Eye and Creep Show, those anthologies, they would always be on like Sunday afternoon network like programming. Yeah. And so as a kid, I knew all these little bits and pieces yeah. because it was an anthology, but I didn't I didn't even know what I was watching. For sure. You know, right. so Quitters Inc. especially, which is yes. one of the movies, you know, the little movies we're talking about from Cat's Eye today, uh-huh. that just like really messed with me as a kid and I thought about it for so long and didn't know what it was or how I saw it you know until I got older and it's IMDb pretty messed became up. a thing yeah yeah it's quite messed up but I love how the you know these anthologies in creep show which we're not talking about but it's kind of hard to not think about it of course, we're talking yeah. about Stephen King anthologies oh, yeah. there's, there's another Stephen King yeah movie. yeah creep show. Yeah, yeah it's just like they feel like little urban legends they remind me yeah. of like scary stories to tell in the dark but right. kind of for grown-ups but I think that that's where a lot of those stories originated were some of those either you know fables that were you know to to either scare kids to go to sleep or <laughs> that you know that they w- would brush their teeth or they would be good as kids but yeah <laughs> also you know short stories that were just told and old wives tales things like that like i mean i know we're kind of jumping into cat's eye but like the cat stealing the breath from a baby you know that's yes. r- a real important piece of that of general is the name of that episode um but you know then they find out you know it's not the cat that's doing it it's this strange carlo rambaldi creature that uh <laughs> is pretty awesome in my opinion i think that that's a really cool little troll creature but it was cool that they kind of brought in some things that you're familiar with but then explained it away you know in their version yeah. i thought that was interesting why would general take my breath if he has his own uh well you have to put all the animals outside in the night i mean especially the cat animals because if you don't they climb up and sit on your chest and suck all your breath out like this. <laughs> that is very, very helpful, Hugh. Oh, thank you very, very much. Oh, now, come on, sit down and have your breath. No, no, jokes about my mother's accent in the morning just have this way of killing my appetite. Yeah, definitely. And what's funny about that, you know, so I host a year round Halloween history podcast where I dive into the history. It's research based and it, I dive into the history of Halloween icons and traditions and celebrations. And uh, I've been researching witches connection to Halloween for months and months now. Mm. And I'm going to have like a series on witches. Cool. And the cat's breath thing is also connected to witches and this idea that yeah. like a woman would turn into a cat to get into your home and to steal oh. your soul and ah. commune with the devil and give the devil your soul. So what's, what's the Kim Novak and, uh, and Jimmy Stewart movie. That's I married a not witch, vert- not vertigo. No, it's uh it's, it's like the Christmas movie, right? It was like, a- yeah. I, oh, that's Veronica Lake is. So I married a witch, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. bell book and candle. Yes, thank you. Yes, yes, you're welcome. See, that's video store brain. I didn't look anything up. That was amazing. I, yeah. I was thank waiting you. to see if, you know, I could see your eyes like darting around. Yeah. Or something. Did they, no, did did they roll up into my yeah. head? Or? That's kind of more what you're like a mentat. Like, <laughs> Drooled, you <know>. yeah. <laughs> no, you, you, yeah, you, you went full uh, you know, David Keith, not Keith David, and went wah, yeah. wah, 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 and, and pulled that one out. <laughs> see, so I've worked at video stores for half my life now. Video tech here in South Pasadena. That's how Jeremy and I know each other. Um <laughs> Uh, this is my fifth video store that I've worked at. So my whole <laughs> life, my obsessions have been like Stephen King, Halloween, and video stores. And they perfectly <laughs> meld together. I mean, um, and, and also you have to maybe explain for just certain people that like, yes, they still exist. They do uh, still exist. In fact, there's in dozens places. of them yeah. all across the United States still. Yeah. And in L.A., we have a handful of them still. And I'm a huge advocate for video stores. It's very important to me because, you know, Absolutely. Video Tech has over 40,000 titles. 
uh, Vidiots, which is going to be reopening in mm-hmm. uh, in Los Angeles, they have over 70,000 titles. Holy cow, really? And so now let's talk about how much is on streaming. If you had Cinefile every single too, streaming, right? right, yes. But if you have every single streaming service, which no one can afford anyways, it's more expensive <laughs> than cable to do that. <laughs> but even adding up all the movies they have, it's less than 10,000 movies. Wow, that's a good so, stat. So, you know, we have... You have access to less than a quarter of what we have at Videotech. And I mean, I can't really, math isn't my thing, but like (laughs) just the smallest fraction of what actually exists out there. And I think I, I, you know, dream of a world where video stores have a comeback and we have both streaming and video stores because streaming is important for people to have accessibility. Yep. You know, it's great, especially as we're still in a pandemic and it's not safe for everybody to leave the house. Streaming offers a really great alternative, Mm -hmm. but we cannot act like it is the same as a video store or that these, you know, corporations really have the cinephile in mind. They're not art lovers. They're not film lovers. They really just want to make money. So the titles they're going to be promoting are going to be the ones that are the most surefire thing. Anything that has too hard to license, anything that <laughs> hasn't, you know, been digitized. Like right. there's tons of stuff it that still only archived. exists. Yeah, it needs to yes. exist still. Yeah. Exactly, because otherwise it disappears. And you know the voices we lose are queer artists, people of color, women. Mm people who don't have a lot of money and aren't connected to a studio system, like super DIY independent filmmakers. Plus that's how I grew up. I I grew up, you know, searching the walls, mostly in the horror section. I would sit there and look (laughs) at all the covers and I would always be like, I want this as a poster. I want this as a t-shirt. The artwork that was done. you, You mentioned that this being an art form it was also kind of a gallery that you could walk through as a fan of these yeah. things and to see Absolutely. see the art that goes along with it because that that whole marketing angle of of especially VHSs back in the day was really interesting because the covers made these movies all look so badass some of them yeah. sucked you know and that was fine yeah. but you know what the, the <laughs> that art and like the the whole like 360 approach to this is a movie we need to create uh key art for it we need to you know put it in a box it needs to be you know, sexy to look at, to touch, to buy, to rent, whatever that is. But, you know, it needed Mm -hmm. to have its own space. It kind of reminds me of the wine world. You know, you've got like a wine bottle. It has a a certain uh, look or a label on it and it has a history behind it. And you can kind of look into that based on that. So I think it all kind of goes hand in hand. But, you know, you're losing that on Netflix, right? You're not getting that on Shudder. You're just well, exactly. Well, you talk about the box too. Paragraphs would be written on the back about yeah. what type of movie it would be as well. And now we get maybe a sentence to go off of. From and Netflix. sometimes it doesn't match what the movie's about, or they miss the point. <laughs> well, because how can you distill a, even a ninety-minute film to a sentence or two? And let's not forget too, mm-hmm. you're missing the human element. Video stores, yeah, especially say, now, exactly. are yeah. pumped full of people who actually love film totally. and can talk to you about film. And one of the reasons I love working there is not just because. I get free movies and I get to watch movies, but I get <laughs> Wait, to talk I need to, to start people. <laughs> yeah, you <laughs> you should. <laughs> I'll get you a job. <laughs> awesome. um, there, you get to talk to people about movies all day, and like, yeah. yeah, not every customer rules. Like, I want every customer to be like you, but you know, some people are like grumpy older women who just want to rent like Downton Abbey style <laughs> stuff and British murder mysteries. I don't sure. love those people because they can be kind of crotchety, but <laughs> a lot of times I get to turn people on to. Stuff, you know, right, or like yeah. we, oh, it's really cool. We have this like great 14 or 15 year old girl who comes in and rents horror every week, and I'm just like obsessed with her because I'm like, okay, now try this, now try this. <laughs> I just feel like, like I get to be this really small part of her like horror development that will, like, I don't yeah, know, turn I, her into who she's going to be. I don't think it's, a, be. it's that small. I, I think you're underselling it for ah, sure. Well, it, thank you're, you. You're, you're, you're helping her out <laughs> and expanding all these horizons that people like would never think of or, or see, like, it would never be fed to them with the algorithm. They're not, never going to be like browse and have something catch their eye or like have a section like, oh, that's an interesting way to organize that. And right. you know I mean? or finding a gem that wasn't put in the right place. And all of a sudden you find a movie that <laughs> I, I know that sounds sure. odd, but that's like a thing. Yeah. Like sometimes I, 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 you know, I think Cat's Eye might have been one of those movies that I found like randomly, you know, like it was mm-hmm. one of those that I'm like, what the hell is this? The cover is fine. It shows the troll, which is the best part of the movie. <laughs> but other than that, it was like, what the hell is this? But I had to watch it. Yeah, I was like, I love cats. (laughs) I was like a kid. (laughs) Well, I think what's interesting is that these streaming services and and other things online, they give you these like (laughs) recommendation engines, right? Like that's the algorithm that you're talking about. It's like, well, you watch this, so you'd like this. But then all of a sudden you start getting like put into this box once those Mm -hmm. recommendations start hitting. 
But like with what you're doing is, you know, you've got that human element and you're introducing this young person to horror and you could take it in so many different directions. It's not like, oh, you liked Juwan or you liked some of these Korean films. So you're only going to get Korean films fed right, to you. Right, horror, and, right. and now I'm going to take you into, you know, the Hong Kong uh, horror cinema or, you know, other types of, you know, French cinema and things like that. And you can kind of move around, but, which still the robots don't uh, allow that yet, you know? Right. <laughs> well, like one of my favorite um, genres is Giallo, and that's yeah. something oh, that God. is not you, yeah, you accessible, need to be on the show really. more often. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, I'd love to come back. Yeah. I, and th- oh, we'll do an films. Argento block for sure. <laughs> oh, fantastic. You know who else I love is uh, Sergio Martino. Uh, he did the film uh, Torso. And, uh, Torso's your- great. Torso yeah, is, is, I love is really Torso. St- stupidly great. I love it. It's yeah. like a proto Halloween. There's like so many shots in it that I feel like John Carpenter had to have been inspired by. Nice. Oh, I bet. Yeah. Uh, and and he has uh, he has some great titles. Your vice is a locked room, and only I have the key. <laughs> all the colors of the dark. The strange vice of Mrs. Ward. Like wow. they're all so like the imagination. It yeah, like, exactly. It just, Oh, it conjures such incredible things. It doesn't things. really fit on a marquee, but it, it yeah, exactly. It, it's this little like piece of poetry that elicits a lot of imagery. Yes. Know? And like maybe some of those are on Shutter sometimes, but Shutter's a specialty service that you have to pick and you have to be willing. You have to already be a horror fan because you have to be like, I'm going to put $6 a yep. month towards horror. Right. And I still think that horror people don't all know about it. Like the diehards do, but people who like to jump around and watch different genres Mm-hmm. I introduce people to Shutter all the time because I I'm thinking it's this obvious thing and it's not. People yeah, have lives. Not. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> they're, yeah. <laughs> they're not just like thinking about films constantly. Um, and it's like, how would you ever find the Red Queen kills seven times? Netflix isn't going to be like, <laughs> here you go. Like, you know? Yeah, exactly. And we just can't let these things linger in obscurity or only be for certain people. Like, film is for everyone. And video stores were a thing that could, you could become a cinephile at 13. You know? Like, now it's like, it feels. Cinephiles aren't born, they're created. Yes, through video stores. (laughs) Right, exactly. And people lament like the gatekeeping online and it's like, sure, you know, you're always going to get in the back in the day, like kind of a bully video clerk once in a while who'd make fun of you for what you're renting. But like, that's kind of the right charm now, though, isn't it? It is part of the charm. I had one basically redirected me away from all the like shitty stuff I was watching. It right. could be helpful. And was like, oh, hey, you should watch Evil Dead instead of like M. Night Shyamalan. <laughs> hey, I still like M. Night Shyamalan. I'm a little bit of a defender, but I'm a defender. I thank God. I'm defender for sure thank yeah. you thank you thank yeah. god he said evil dead though because that movie like rocked my world when i was 17 and i had no idea it existed yeah i watched yeah. that movie way too young but it changed my life in the best way yes sure. uh famously that poster has a great stephen king quote on it yeah yeah that's true <laughs> which one is that Be- because he saw it in like can and oh oh really his, his, qu- his like quote sell. like his yeah, yeah. Yeah, he has the whole thing yeah. about one of the, one of the scariest like, like movies ever made. I think that's yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what, what blew that movie up. It was like a midnight movie at a, at a festival, right? And Stephen King going to see it and saying something, I think, blew that thing up out of the water. And that's why Sam Raimi yeah. is now who Sam Raimi is. Exactly. Yeah. He's a tastemaker. Yeah. <laughs> as are we. And l- let's talk about some of our tastes today uh, as we venture into segue. the Department of Scientific Intelligence, or also better known as The Shop. <laughs> The shop. Yeah. <laughs> Let's start with Firestarter this here. This isn't the CIA. It's the shop. <laughs> Department of Defense. So much more no, fun. scientific <laughs> intelligence. <laughs> because we're scientific and both smart. Um, yes, this was the first time I've seen this all the way through. Um, I have to say, as cheesy and plot hole as it is, I love this movie. I thought it. I think. I think I loved it mostly because the ending comes through very strong um and everything kind of yeah. pays off at the end and also drew barrymore is is absolutely excellent in it well you, you could also see that like wow they saved the budget for the end huh like <laughs> <laughs> they were fucking up the shop the, the sort of like uh antebellum era like virginia estate uh former plantation she was like shooting fireballs and like destroying the hell out of it you let them know that this is a war charlie you make it so they can't ever do anything like this again. We we'll have to burn it all down, baby. Burn it all down. They were they were asteroids, I believe. Yeah. Were coming out of <laughs> yes. At that point. I I I I said that. 
it, when I was watching that, I was like, oh, this is like Final Fantasy when you get your first fire <laughs> spell and it's like fire one, we're just going to burn mom's hands. And then fire three is when all of a sudden you're letting off nuclear explosions. <laughs> what, what, when, you're, when you're Fireball Island? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> She was I told to keep ball. it under to keep it under wraps that yeah, it would be too exactly. dangerous. They and she pushed did. her she, too she far. She pushed it down, yeah. And then all of a sudden, you know, they they kind of did it to themselves, right? They pushed yeah. her to the limits, and then all of a sudden, she they found out who she really was. Lots even though of they great parallels. It out. Yes, exactly. They knew she was dangerous. Yeah. They kept <laughs> saying that. But I, what I think is interesting, and this is going to be me putting a little bit of a feminist lens on it, is yeah. that while they think that she's dangerous, I think they still underestimated exactly. her because she's a Correct. little girl. Exactly. Yeah. Correct. I suppose there's a little girl out there somewhere today, this morning, who has within her, lying dormant at present, the power someday to crack the very planet in two like a china plate in a shooting gallery. What if we could train this little girl? Could we ever have more powerful weapons? Like, I don't think they thought that was going to happen. And I think there's some interesting parallels with this story and with Carrie as well. Because sure. essentially, you know, the same thing is everyone's like, mm -hmm. Ugh, what could Carrie do? Very and similar locked story. locked in the gym. Very similar story. And, and I think... <laughs> they're all going to laugh at you. There's, there's something about Carrie that I think is a little bit more like grounded and people can relate to a little bit more. Because yes. it's really like coming of age like the, and high school and dealing with and, that. Yeah. Um, totally. This one is like, well, you know, you're a superhero and... And, you know, this this group over here is going to unleash you as, you know, the fire starter. But yeah, at the same and some time, like I think Vietnam it's all era. Parallel. Yeah, exactly. Yes. And like the yeah Vietnam era paranoia and like the fallout of Vietnam, yeah. like what we did well, is well, going to last longer. Stephen King talked about like how, you know, a lot of this is inspired by that paranoia that you're talking about, but more from like Watergate, because it's like all of a sudden oh. that, you know, uh, internalizes the, the distrust. You met a trespass. I want you to get the hell off my property. We're government agents, sir. These two folks are wanted for questioning, nothing more. I don't care if they're wanted for assassinating the president. Show me a warrant to get the hell off my land. We don't need a warrant. You do unless I woke up in Russia this morning. If you'll just get in the car, we can discuss all this. And then the church committee comes out and dives into, you know, all the terrible things that the FBI and the CIA were doing, including, you know, harassing and trying to get Martin Luther King to kill himself and all these other things, domestic spying with the CIA and the, what, what, what do they call it? The, um, oh God, MK Ultra, like the uh, MK, MK Ultra. Ultra. Like, yeah. Uh, that's like what Stranger Things is about. Exactly. And yeah. this movie, God, inspired the living shit out of Stranger Things. I mean, huh? the, the yes. nose, the nose bleeds and everything. And like every, every time, I'm sorry, Keith, David. Or David Keith. David, David, David Keith. Keith. David Keith. Every time David Keith would use his powers, he had he had a nose bleed, right? And then it was like they use that same motif in Stranger Things. Clearly an inspiration there, but you know this is kind of the the precursor to that, I would say, especially the experimentation. Even though like uh, they use the Stephen King font for Stranger Things. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's the needful things. Uh, Thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah, stack. Yeah. I think it's interesting though, because everybody does talk about how it's clearly inspired by Stephen King, but I don't see Firestarter getting the type of love and even cult appreciation that yeah. I really think it deserves. And I, I love Stephen King growing up. I, you know, I had read all of his books in high school and mm -hmm. college, and then. Firestarter, I the book is incredible. The book is. is so detailed. There's so much. It's more like half. A lot of it is about the experiments. There's like mm -hmm. really scary like stuff with the um, all the tripping and everything. It gets like really really intense. I figured there's got to be more totally. to that, right? Especially in the writing. I mean, in the book, mm -hmm. yeah, they really glossed over that in the movie. How are you feeling? When we start to shrink. Fine. We'd be fine. <laughs> and I was I was confused if the if the hallucinogens were giving them the power or unlocking that power. <laughs> I, I, I didn't right because they weren't right. they didn't really make that clear in the movie. Yeah, yeah, you know, that's a good point. I thought that it was unlocking it, that it was like every so person had this ability, and but we needed to see who could handle it and who couldn't. That's why some people were like pulling their eyes out and like it was too much <laughs> for some people. And then the book, you know, his descriptions are so horrifically fantastic that right. there's just like people scraping off all their skin and yeah. tearing out all their hair. And there's just like <laughs> any horrible, violent thing you can picture. I remember reading that and then just being so 
terrified and being like momentarily never wanting to do drugs. Yeah. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Maybe that's a cautionary that tale for acid. Yeah. It didn't last long. Yeah, I think a couple of years later I did drop acid for the first time. But I was like, I choose this. I'm not yeah. in a government study. <laughs> My friend uh, Hayden got it for Jolly me. and West is not doing this against my will. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. You know, the, the the details are so interesting in the the King story, and you know the the book. If you haven't read it, is definitely one of those ones to pick up. It's like, you know, Stephen King is always accused of sort of overwriting and being, you know, very verbose, but this one has a, an extremely fast pace, and really, you know, I- anybody. Totally. Uh, can kind of get into it. So there's a little plug for that. But, um, you know, the other thing is that, like, um, the head of the shop in this is Martin Sheen. And uh, Martin Sheen, the year before, was the, whatever, uh, presidential candidate in the dead zone. Right. Another Stephen King uh, adaptation. And then it turns out they're watching the dead zone in Cat's Eye. <laughs> when James Woods is watching it at one point when he's like biting his nails off and biting the, you know, his cigarette. Even better for it to be a double feature. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Well, and, and that's the thing I was like, man, what we should have done was probably triple feature this one with, with, dead, with zone. the dead zone. With the dead zone. That's <laughs> smart. A, another connection maybe between the dead zone adaptation and the Firestar adaptation, just besides like the casting, is that like, what they did was they took all the sort of plot points out of the book. They scraped away all the cartilage and just jammed it all together so that, like, you know, Brian, for you, who hadn't, hadn't read the book, you know, you're just like, well, wait, how did we get from here to here? And, like, how did they know this is happening and whatever? And you just kind of have to, like, go with it sometimes. And and sometimes it's like, well, wait a minute, there's just a, a giant sort of leap to conclusions there. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, uh, I think Dead Zone is more guilty of that than, than Firestarter. But there's definitely a little bit in this one. Yeah, Dead Zone almost doesn't make sense. Oh, really? It's hard to understand? I think it is. Well, it's also Cronenberg. So everything with Cronenberg yeah. is a little more meditative sure. and um, cerebral in a way mm. where you're like, is he making a choice or is he being like obtuse on purpose? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I remember being so disappointed when I uh, after every time I'd finish a Stephen King book, then I would go to the video store and rent the movie to watch the adaptation (laughs) and almost immediately be disappointed because people don't know how to adapt King's work. What's beautiful about it is it's wildly scary, but it's also so deeply humane and empathetic and the descriptions. I mean, a friend of mine told me that he hated Stephen King because he would spend five minutes describing a chair that someone was in, (laughs) but that's what I love. I'm like, yes, tell me more about the chair. Like it just, he paints a scene so that like by the time the horror starts, you're in it instead of like being able to construct a wall. And you're invested, yeah. You know, like, maybe this is what you meant, but like, but you're invested in what those people are going through. Like, you, yes. you want them to get out of it. You care yes. about these characters, and you're like, yeah. you, you know, you, you care about their like their sort of like kitchen sink drama, and like, oh, are they going to get the promotion? Are they going to get you know the, the head <laughs> in school or whatever? And you're worried about that, and then all of a sudden something horrifying happens, and you're like, oh no. <laughs> yeah, all of a sudden, yeah, all of a sudden supernatural forces are involved, yeah. and you're like, but his promotion. Yeah. <laughs> because I think that's, that's what he does so so great yeah. is that he he combines realism with that horror, and he'll ground yeah. something so much, and then all of a sudden throw something at you that is just, yeah, wall what the up fuck you. is that? You know? right. Yes, and that's why the adaptations suck, because the people who are making horror films typically don't, they like you said, they scrape it all, and mm-hmm. they just keep the weird stuff, but... I don't think it worked. I mean, of course, visually very exciting. And I think this movie is very fun. But I do think you lose a little bit of heart, even though Drew Barrymore makes up for it in spades. because She's like the cutest little creature oh, that's yeah. ever lived. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I would, I know they just did a remake of Firestarter. And I can't remember if it was a movie or a, a miniseries, but I read movie, terrible. They made a sequel that was a miniseries. Uh, um, called Firestarter Rekindled. <laughs> and yeah. apparently John, Ray, Rain, John Rainbird lived uh, after the detonated yes. bomb of a, of a bullet burned him to death. And yeah. he also came back as Malcolm McDowell. So it was a really <laughs> odd shift of recasting. Oh. Yeah, Malcolm McDowell yeah. is a great... It would be a great choice. Great yeah. choice, but character. I mean, shouldn't John Rainbird be an indigenous person? Uh, Absolutely. Which I think oh. he is. I think uh, John Grey Eyes, or I, I, yeah. I think his name is... Uh, is 
Michael Gray is, right? Yeah. Oh, that's who George C. Scott played? Yeah. Oh, John is the character's first name. But Sorry, George yeah. C. Scott is not indigenous. Absolutely not. He's and not. that's I think yeah, that, okay. that was going to bring up some, you know, that was a bit of an issue. Uh, George right? yeah. C. Scott's Irish. Yeah, he's uh, he's not indigenous at all. <laughs> I was like, maybe I don't know. I want to give space. Well, when they said it, when they were saying his name, I'm like, oh, it's Rainburn. No, no, no. You know, it's like R-A-E-N-B-U-R-N. I'm like, it's not Rain Bird, who's clearly an indigenous name, right? And I'm yeah. like, I didn't understand. Well, and okay, when I saw hey, the credits, on. I'm like, oh, that's not right. I, that totally went over my head, I think, as a teenager. Same. I, well, I mean, as a 40-year-old, yeah. Well, yeah, I wasn't paying attention, I guess, here either. <laughs> I always thought it was Rain Burn. That Rain was Bird, the, yeah. Oh, interesting. So, so that was the thing I was, I was wondering, like, in this movie... I mean, they do mention his name as, as Rainbird, and maybe you, if you don't catch it, it's Rainburn or something. But like in this movie, is he supposed to be uh, indigenous? They they don't talk about that, but that his character is right. Well, in the book it was, but right, in, like in this adaptation, is he supposed? They, they to They never be... they never mention that now, okay. but because yeah. uh, otherwise, I mean, like you could also be like, okay, well, you know, he. He got that nickname, Nam, or something. You know, it's just like yeah, one of those things. Because he rained like, down he was very... on, on, on the enemy. Or, yeah. yeah, with yeah. his helicopter. Yeah, exactly. There you go. Yeah. Whirly bird. Yeah. His yeah. whirly bird. Yeah. <laughs> his bad copter. <laughs> oh, my gosh. We train young men to drop fire on people. But their commanders won't allow them to write fuck on their airplane because... It's obscene. <laughs> <laughs> I know we're still dealing with like injustices towards indigenous actors and writers, directors, sure. creators in, in general, but it's just like, gosh, you couldn't have even done that. Like George C. Scott, obviously magnificent. The Changeling's one of my favorite horror movies. Yeah. But like we could not have just gotten an indigenous actor. There were still plenty in the 80s. Right. Or change the name or, or, or do something, you know, like maybe recast I, that. Honestly, the, the, there isn't anything inherent with the character that you kind of need to have it be there. So if Oh, if you Scott mean like is, in the story itself? Yeah. So so it's like if, if Scott is like the name that's going to help you get butts in seats or whatever, well, then you right. can just change the character. Why not right, change exactly. the character name, though? I think it's right. I think the part that seems a little offensive yeah. is like keeping a clearly indigenous sure. name yeah, sure. and exactly, being like yeah. the whitest sure. man. Also, though, I do think not that there's any of this in the movie to be read, but I do think there's something interesting about like an indigenous person working for the government to like... Yeah. extinguish other people to like collect and get rid of people who are different he's an assassin or, or a hunter or a, a tracker uh, yeah if, well but like it, in the book it, it it or and i don't know if this doesn't really come out and i think they do touch on this a little bit in the in the uh 2022 remake mm. but in, in the book now, remake, i, I want to say that this is a big moment that jeremy actually saw a remake by the way yeah. he, he, <laughs> jeremy doesn't do sequels doesn't do remakes <laughs> Oh, you great. Know, leave Jeremy and I have that in common. Alone, yeah. You motherfuckers, <laughs> don't, don't mess up my, my dreams. Um, exactly. But I'm, I haven't even seen the remake yet. Yeah, I, I, I haven't. I've got an ending here, and I want to keep it that way. <laughs> no, um, yeah, so it, in the sort of uh, the book, the idea is that, like, more or less, this character has been sort of, like, brought through the, the ringer of the, the U.S., uh, you know, military industrial complex to you know, come out the other side, this like psychotic lunatic and, you know, just kind of the a Jason absolute Bourne. perfect like killing machine. And like, that's the trajectory that perhaps Charlie is on and mm -hmm. that, that, that there's some sort of like, you know, kinship that there, he feels with her in, in that sense as well. So more like a Manchurian candidate or, or like a, like a person you can activate, uh, you kind know, like... of, I mean, I, you know, it's, it's more like a commentary on like, you know, what, what, uh, happens to people who become soldiers. Right. Okay, and yeah. and then the idea is that in the book there was you know this guy uh, the Rainbird had this like insane death drive, and you know wanted it to uh, be as uh, spectacular as possible, and like you know so he wanted to like be the one to to kill Charlie at the end uh, after gaining her trust, so that you know when she goes supernova he can uh, be at uh, ground zero, but like you know and it's a very complicated very. Uh, psychologically driven motivation in this one in the movie they kind of made him just seem like a pedophile right uh, yes it, pedophile was, psychotic was no okay. totally what are you gonna do with her john the friendly orderly will come in he will greet her talk to her get her to smile 
John, the friendly orderly, will make her happy because he's the only one who can. And when John feels that she has reached the moment of her greatest happiness, he will strike her across the bridge of the nose, breaking it explosively and sending bone fragments into her brain. I didn't get pedophile, but I did, I did get psychotic. And he, he, oh, I know what you're saying. He was saying little hints at like I'm gonna have I'm gonna get her, her alone with me. Yeah, she's yeah. Gonna, kind of she's stuff. gonna be I'm mine. I'm gonna look into her eyes right. when okay. I crack her across the my, face. I changed my tune. I, I agree. It was yeah. Very serial <laughs> killer. <laughs> Did you know that this movie was originally gonna be a John Carpenter film uh, before the yes. thing bombed? Y- yes, and then he was able to get Christine, but it took some doing, I think. Ah, really? And, and so maybe that's why in the 2022 version of Firestarter, John Carpenter did the music. Oh, that's oh, right. Oh, wow. Because Consolation prize? <laughs> Jason Blum or whatever is like, you know, huge Carpenter fan. He's like, hey, why don't you come in here and uh, do some of this? Yeah. Play some of your music, John. <laughs> yeah. You know you can get this movie back in, the, back in the 80s. Here, take this. Do that thing you do. Do that. Do, do, yeah. do, do, do. do that thing you do. <laughs> I thought it was interesting because it was the same writer, uh, Burt Lancaster's son, Bill, who wrote the thing or the screenplay for the thing, the adaptation. Oh. Uh, he was going to write that screenplay as well. But then and then also Burt Lancaster was going to play the Martin Sheen role, which I thought Ooh. was interesting. Oh, um, wow. But that all didn't work out, obviously. That would have been maybe an extension of his executive action yeah, exactly. uh, role. Yeah, exactly. Like the, uh, he's, he's been in this role of, before. <laughs> 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 deep state uh, like you know evil Machiavellian character what are you gonna do with the fire starter it's easy <laughs> executive action <laughs> what kind of action <laughs> executive <laughs> anything else with fire starter should we should we uh, keep going what are you guys is how do you feel about it like what are your what's your general takeaway I, I thought like any Stephen King adaptation I feel like there's a lot missing that didn't get translated properly I think that that happens all the time I think the best adaptation yeah. is The Outsider from from Stephen King's work uh, that mm. was a series that was on HBO and I think mm. his work can only be done in long form series if you're really going to try to touch on everything I did yeah. think Mike Flanagan really killed it oh, with Doctor Sleep yes uh, I thought that was really good and it was interesting because that was a sequel to both the book <laughs> The Shining as yeah. well as a sequel to the movie The Shining I know and people like could not handle it it was like <laughs> that was the most exhausted I think I've ever been in my life was explaining to every person I interacted with right. that it's a sequel to the book it's a sequel to the book and that it's also based on a book because people were getting like all worked up thinking that yeah. like Mike Flanagan had an idea to like improve a upon one of the greatest horror movies of all time. And it's like, no, y'all, this is already a book. And I thought thought he just did the best job of blending the empathy and the humanity with the horror. And I've just never seen anybody do that with his work And I think he's done that with all of his work. Flanagan, I mean. I think that he's, you know, he took the turning of the screw or the turn of the screw and the haunting of Hill House. Mm -hmm. And he took those and actually, you know, focused more on the human aspect and then when you start getting really in touch with the humans or connected to these, all of a sudden ghosts start popping up, you know, in and the like worst all way. Scary. And like some, yeah. you know, girl hung or hanged uh, just drops in the middle of your car. And you're like, what the fuck? You know, it's the worst <laughs> thing. But yeah. it's, it's just he does a great job with that interplay. Well, and that's fascinating, too, because Shirley Jackson was such a huge inspiration to Stephen King. Mm. And they both have this incredible quality where they 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 know how to write about mundane cruelty yeah. you know just like the little injustices of daily life and how right. to turn that into extreme horror and mike flanagan i feel like he's another voice in that that he understands that horror can be much smaller and yes. it can look you can do incredible things you know with effects and description but like you start small you don't okay. have to have a huge set piece. No, not at all. And I, I, I think even Midnight Mass, he, he did a great job with that. And that was kind of Loved his own. It. That was his own thing. That was like purely his own thing. Which, Didn't that feel mm, like Stephen King? Absolutely, though? yeah. Like yeah. that felt like a Stephen King. The the, the family element of it, the tragedy yep. of it. Exactly. Yeah. Big fan. <laughs> I'm glad I I talk about Mike Flanagan because I think he's the next. Uh, well. I think he's the next big thing in horror. He although he's been the big thing in horror for quite a few years now, but I think that. Like the fall of the House of Usher is going to be his n- the next project, and I, I I can't wait for that. You know, like that's same. Yeah, so he was supposed to do the adaptation for the Stephen King book Revival, which is a newer mm. book of King's and my favorite of his newer books. Have you nice. two read it? No, oh, I haven't oh, read I'm, that one yet. 
I really recommend it. It feels okay. like an 80s pre-Coke uh, <laughs> Stephen King. Like it's focused, <laughs> but it also just has all of that like after school creepiness feeling to it. Awesome. Yeah. I really love it. And I was heartbroken when that ended up getting shelved because I'm dying to see an adaptation of it. But again, it's or, like or a lot not. of family yeah. stuff. So I don't, yeah, I don't want just somebody coming in and being like, it's a creepy yeah. preacher. And I'm like, oh, right, no. Right, right. Well, I think the next uh, King adaptation that is coming from the Duffer Brothers, the Stranger Things folks, they're going to do the Talisman. I think that was the That's right. The, the, the announcement with all of their, they have a little production company now, right? Yeah. Little. <laughs> this <Yeah>. is me <laughs> condescending to the Duffer Brothers. Well, good luck with your little oh, you're gonna company. Make the little you're going to shoot cute. some footage. Isn't that cute? Yeah. I'm Aww. rooting for you guys. Are you, you guys going to edit too? You're going to put movie <laughs> Tippity classic. tappity on your little keyboard. <laughs> so imaginative. <laughs> yeah. So let's move on to uh, 1985's Cat's Eye. Again, horror anthology, big nerd, big fan when it comes to anthology films, although this is by far not my favorite. Again, Creepshow and the old Tales from the Crypt probably hold those as my faves. Um, and I even like that one um, Halloween one we just talked about that I'm blanking on the name of. Trick or Treat. Trick or Treat. I think that that one is just really fun. Um, but this one was interesting. I have one main question, though. We, we talk about this with anthologies a lot, and there's always the spine or uh -huh. whatever that through line is that kind of connects everything, which this one is general, the cat, right? The it's stray just cat. a cat, a little kitty running around town. But there is one more piece of it, and yeah. it's that strange disembodied uh, Drew Barrymore yeah, that yeah. shows up in Mannequins for some reason that never and gets paid off. And, and on TV, but that never gets paid off at the end, right? Or is that Drew Barrymore well, from the end... It's. I think it's supposed to be Drew Barrymore from the end, right? So like, she's calling. You need to hurry, get to me before the troll steals my breath. And I don't know why you're. I'm calling to you, but yeah. So she's kind of the sh using her shining, if you will, to get in contact with the yeah, cat. Yeah, because we're seeing those things from the cat's point of view, which is interesting. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I love the beginning of this that it becomes kind of like a little love letter to all these Stephen King things. You've got like yeah. the Christine car that drives by, yeah. you know, you, you've got all these Cujo. little moments and you're just like, Oh, in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Cujo. That was the other one that the dog is creepy. Same director as well. Right. Yeah, exactly. There, there's a decent adaptation for you, uh, from book to movie. I mean, like there, there's, you know, a lot more to be mined out of, uh, the affair and all this stuff, but With the Cujo? Cujo movie is mm. uh is is pretty watchable yes definitely that's a really good movie it doesn't have the actual beginning of the book though which is what scared me so much where oh, the, the serial killer it doesn't yeah the idea that there's like this evil in town I, doesn't the movie make it more just like he's rabid doesn't it sort of leave uh, yeah. leave aside the well, well because you know if you if you just sort of like chop off that that first like you know 12 pages of the book, you know, you, you just go straight it's into a, it and he's rabid. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But that beginning of the book fucked with me. I still don't like yeah, yeah, having yeah. a closet door open even a little bit because of that <laughs> book. <laughs> so yeah. wait, in, in, that, in that story, there was a, a whole like backstory of a serial killer happening that didn't really that, have a That was point. kind of like, yeah, exactly. Well, it was, it was this thing that was like just hanging over the town, almost like a curse or like... That's like Gerald's you know, game. There's that and that, and that, and that as well. It's just like Gerald's yeah. game. Yes, yeah. this like figure who's looming in the shadows, which is, I feel like that's maybe my biggest fear. It's just something odd in a corner. Mm -hmm. Sure. <laughs> it's just like yeah, really, really or, upsetting. Or breaking through your, your baseboard and uh, coming to steal your breath. <laughs> just... <laughs> I thought that was a great effect, sword. by the way, when that when that hole would open up on the floor yeah. and it would kind of stop motion itself closed, and yes. it looked like it was screwed up, but it it, it closed up cleanly. I thought that was <laughs> a really cool exactly. effect. Yeah. Well, let's talk about each of the stories because yeah. I'm really curious, like which one stood out to you guys. So there's like the three main stories, and for me, I love Quitters Inc. and I love the final story, but the middle yeah. one just feels. <laughs> boring to me <laughs> oh my god the ledge oh god it's starring it's so the, funny the, too. the lead of airplane and yes. then baron harkonnen <laughs> from baron Dune. It's like, yeah what the hell uh yeah i agree with you that one didn't land for me at and all. and the guy from the lufthansa heist and uh in goodfellas you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah beautiful what about the security no oh, security <laughs> you're looking at it. it's a joke i'm the midnight date man i'm the commandant <laughs> Beautiful. Also, strange casting, right? Let, let's let's go into uh, Quitters Inc. Uh, yeah, you know we've got James Woods who you we've know, got a pre-casino uh, James Woods and Alan King, uh, you know, pairing here. You smoke, they'll see you. 
and bring me down here and s stick me in the old cat room, I suppose. No. We bring your wife down here and stick her in a cat room. You get to watch. But Alan King, is, isn't he a stand-up comic? Like an old-school yeah, yeah. stand-up comic? Totally. I mean, that was just really interesting to have him be a pseudo-villain. Uh, he was great, though. He, great. The, 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 like, smiling maniacally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just I, happy to show him torturing a cat. He was like, yeah, we're yeah. just going to put this cat that in this electric room. That part kind of shocked me because yeah. I don't think they would have a scene like that now, even though you don't see the cat get hurt. The cat's fine. The cat lives. But the yeah. idea is that oh, a cat awful. is in an electric room and the cat's being shocked by electric well, and, pulses and the uh, the um, sort of film's perspective is that that this is a bad thing you know i mean it's it it's it's all kind of pointing in the correct direction but you're right like they, they sort of kind of wouldn't do it because maybe it would upset the audience too much yeah i felt kind of well so i want to sc i'm going to screen this for um my patreon to go around to go with our this release of this episode and as yeah. i was watching it i was like oh no because my the it's always halloween lanterns or my listeners <laughs> they're a cozy group you uh -huh. know they like fall and uh, pumpkin spice latte and they like some horror but i was watching it yeah. and i was like oh i don't know if i'm gonna sell them on electrocuting cats <laughs> no no no. <laughs> trust like, me it's funny it's funny yeah it's yeah exactly it's darkly comedic <laughs> And then we, we, we shocked the wife later on. You get it's yeah. funny. It's really funny. And the threat of raping a small girl, hilarious. <laughs> but I don't know. It's so 80s in a way that it like doesn't even register to me as, as fucked up as it is. Because I'm yeah. like, this is such classic 80s. And the fact that this just was on network TV on a Sunday afternoon. Yeah. And at me at like 12 was like, la la la, this is normal. Like, I don't know. That just feels so much like childhood. How awesome. Was the like almost Terry Gilliam like uh, James Rebhorn smoking party uh, that that James Woods went to? Oh, and it was, like, really? it was, that's like, the peak smoke of coming the out of their movie. ears and like yeah, like, and the guy from Meet the Parents, the, yeah, the one that's yeah. a, doesn't even have thumbs. You fucker. didn't want to go for the full MD. <laughs> Dick Morris, oh, come in. Right. Dick, you right. No, I'm just a little, a little tired. Oh, I, it's kind of under the weather. Yeah. Have a cigarette. <laughs> yeah. No. Thanks. No, I'm sorry. I, I quit. I did, really. I mean, it's such a great premise, though. The idea that, like, to get you to quit smoking, we're going to threaten your whole family. Right, right. And, like, it's and not the mafia the attack addicts or whatever. He's like, our founder was uh, part of the mafia or whatever. <laughs> yeah, clearly, which is so funny. <laughs> which I thought was weird because they had the guy in the closet waiting for James Woods, apparently. <laughs> But was he really there or was it just the dude's shoes, right? Like, it was. Yeah, well, we'll he, never throw, know. he throws the umbrella and it's like, oof. <laughs> <laughs> He wouldn't, like, look in there or say something. Like, he just kind of left it alone. I'm going to go back to sleep now with this person in my fucking look, house. I, I, he just, like, snaps the, the cigarette in half. And, like, I, I didn't I smoke mean, it. It's a perfect herald. Like, the way that it heightens, like, each beat of, like, herald, I, yeah. I, I, yeah. like I'm going to, I'm not going to smoke. And you're getting a little threatened. And you're like, I am going to smoke. And then your wife gets threatened. And then, <laughs> oh, okay, now I'm recovered. But, yeah, actually, your wife got more hurt than you realized. Like, it, yeah. the beats, like, the heightening is so perfect. And there was a payoff in this one. This is probably the only one of the three that really did pay off because... At one point, there's a throwaway yeah. line where James Woods is like, well, what about, you know, if I, what, because he starts putting on weight because he started, he quit his smoking. So he was like eating diet pills then. He's like, well, what happens if I get to this weight? He goes, oh, we're going to cut your wife's finger off. It was even better. It was like, he's like, oh, let me guess. If I put on another pound, you're going to cut my finger off? He's like, no, no, no. We're going to cut your wife's finger off. <laughs> 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 and, and then we get the like tales from the crypt ending. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which I think yeah. that that was missing from the other two in this, where, where, where mm. that strong, like, Tales from the Crypt endings. Um, even yeah. Cat's Eye, or um, General, kind of just ended. General ends, yeah. I, I, the cat one, almost, the cat one tricks you into thinking that the cat's going to steal her breath, and then it yes, ends up being right just, like, end, a yeah. nice ending. I like that, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because... Uh, She's just bringing, she's just laying on her lap, right? She's just being an, a cute cat, right? By the end. Well, and it's nice for the cat, too. Right, but, but, but the music cue, the Alan Silvestri music cue is like, <laughs> oh, no, the cat's going to climb up on her bed and steal her breath. And, and great cat training, the way the cat, like, slowly yeah. parts its lips. <laughs> I'm like, oh, no. And, like, a little tongue comes out, and then it's just like. Oh, lick, lick, I love you. Just kidding, I love you. Yeah. But it's cute. great for the cat, too, because the cat has been through a really hard time. Almost got hit by cars, got yeah. electrocuted. Killed like by a troll. 
Yeah. The cat just wants Stabbed to be by loved. A troll. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a happy almost story. got almost got gassed at the humane shelter. Oh yeah, he had that that one day to live. I forgot about right. that part. It's a yeah. successful cat tale. I, I don't know if your if, if your if your patrons are gonna like this movie. <laughs> Maybe you should. Uh... Yeah, I'm not. It's a happy ending, but I I am a little worried about it. Yeah, I. Yeah. It's such a to me. It's like such Stephen King though because it's a little mean. Yeah. But it also is. It's like laughing about, it's like a joke on society. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. It's like, this is like exactly what the 80s were like. Throw everybody under the bus so that you can succeed. You know, <laughs> the Quitters Inc., it's like a perfect yeah. distillation of the 80s. Like, fuck the family, you know? And like that family values was such a huge thing in our culture and in politics mm -hmm. at the time. And that one's really just like, no, fuck my family. I want to smoke cigarettes. Right, right. Right. And, and, and the one thing we, we didn't talk about with that party was that the... The amazing ending of it where Alan King dressed like Elvis is dancing down the stairs to uh, every breath you take. <laughs> It was like, that was so weird. It's so oh. insane. And then isn't every breath you take then is also in Cat's Eye, right, the right. final it, story. It, it the brings general. It back like, like that's what yeah. spins the troll off the, the little oh. uh, hi-fi there. That's one of my favorite parts. So too. really the ledge has nothing to do with any of the other ones except <laughs> well, for there being a cat. And, and it's also weird because, okay, so in... The Quitters Inc., James Wood's uh, special needs daughter, is also played by Drew, uh, Barrymore. Drew Barrymore. And uh, which, by the way, like, did you did you notice the uh, the name of the Cabbage Patch that uh, James Norma Woods Jean. dropped off? Norma Jean. Yeah. Marilyn Monroe. Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> I love Norma Jean. I was like, why? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, well, I don't know because just and then, cute. Yeah. And, and then you get to the ledge, you're right. And like, it's funny because it's, it's a little less comic all the way around. And then it's also the one that does not have Drew Barrymore at all. No, I mean, other than the cat, there's really no tie uh, into the other ones with this one. Yeah. Because the cat is in this one, right? Does, isn't, doesn't the cat end up at uh, Baron Harkonnen's apartment? Right, because they're, they're, like, they're taking bets on if the cat's going to get across the street or not. Oh, that's like... right. Yeah, that's how it starts. Yeah. <laughs> and then and he, and he, he, he wins a couple thousand, so he takes the cat uh, to his penthouse, and the cat finally escapes. And uh, <laughs> That, that one there. kind of had um, me thinking about uh, they're going to creep up on you uh, with uh, E.G. Marshall in yes, Creep Show. Yes, yes, uh, yes, yes. Mr. Pratt. The one that's like stuck up in the clean house that, yeah. you know. Yes, with the hit, cockroaches. With the cockroaches, exactly. I, I would have loved to have had an ending like that, you know, maybe where the cat crawled out of Harkonnen, but instead we just have him fall <laughs> off the ledge. And no, that, that was, uh, that was. Strangely uh, comedic. Oh, God, that, that was Tales, uh, Tales from, from the, the Dark, dark Side. side yeah, yeah, yeah. the yeah. cat comes out of someone's hey, mouth. Th there's another Stephen King. There you go. <laughs> yep. And another anthology and another thing I saw on TV at too young of age and freaked me out. <laughs> Um, so we're not loving the ledge, is what I'm picking up from everybody. No, I I, I love the ledge. I, I think it's hilarious. I I, I, I the, really the story's nuts, and like the the scene. Um, God, what, what's the name of the actor? Robert Hayes, Hayes play. Yeah. Uh, you know, a straight man or whatever. Like and like. <laughs> Especially Every time I like, look at him, I feel like he's sweating in an airplane exactly. going, I've got to concentrate. It's like pouring sweat. I've got to concentrate. concentrate. Hello? Hello? Pinch hitting for Pedro Bourbon. Manny Mota. Mota. But yeah, like it was, it was just odd casting. I thought the villain was fine. I thought Harkonnen is great. The villain you know, was great. Uh, kind of the, the, the henchman was great. Yeah. The, the sort of horror moment, and, and this didn't even happen in the short story, where it's like the Baron Harkonnen character, I guess, had talked about uh, killing her, or maybe she, she was killed uh, off screen or off page. Yeah. But like, uh, they brought it to life in the the movie version, where it's like, you know, he grabs that, you know, grocery sack full of cash, and on top of which is uh, <laughs> her severed head. Awful. And, you know, so it, it's this great little horror moment. That's a great moment. It's really shocking. That kind of reminded me of the Father's Day in Creep Show. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that or uh, something to tide you over. Uh, yes. When he was watching Galen Ross in the same <laughs> right, situation right, that he was, right, but right, drowned. Right. Yeah, that kind of mm -hmm. Yeah, that, 
It's interesting all these things are coming together now. Well, yeah. and, and, you know, Leslie Nielsen's apartment. Also, Leslie Nielsen uh, from, from Airplane. But yeah. Like, <laughs> Leslie Nielsen's apartment in Creepshow is very, you know, kind of that awful architecture is, is in that sunken living room is, is very mm. similar to the Baron Harkonnen's uh, penthouse up there. Yeah, definitely. Very 80s, like lots of money. Kind of has a RoboCop feel to it also. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Good call. Yeah, I really I like the ledge, but I like the the first time. I don't when it when then they make the other guy do it again. I was like, Ugh, I kind of wanted it to be changed. Yeah. Like it felt like a little repetitive. But the bird pecking at the same spot on <laughs> yes. the ankle God. that yeah. is incredible. While it's he's nasty. walking along it's, the it's edge, such oh. a, yeah, it, it's such a perfect like you know horror uh, a sequence where it's like you just like are feeling exactly the pain this guy is going through. You know, <laughs> it's mm-hmm. like. Um, it was that cute little pigeon just like taking yeah. little pecks and then all of a sudden that little spot of and blood that, starts that, and you can yeah. you can literally feel that in your oh, ankle. Yeah. You, you know, yeah. that's that tender spot, you know, right. the Achilles. Oh, man. Exactly. And then getting that uh, pressure hose turned on him. <laughs> I, was, that was, I, I was laughing at most of that. I, I do think it's darkly comedic. Um, Definitely. He, he comes out of the window. It, it reminded me of uh, like the old Batman series when like, you know, the comedians <laughs> would pop out when they're calling the wall. But he would right. just fire the air horn. I, was, I thought that was more funny than it probably was meant to be. However, I, I thought I, that was entertaining to me. But that this is definitely number three of my of my favorites uh, uh-huh. in this in this oh, story. Lord. I'd say uh, General was my first favorite and then Quitter's Inc. and then The Ledge. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I think like what you guys are saying, uh, wanting to have an ending that had a little bit of a button on it would have mm-hmm. really taken it further for me too. I agree. Yeah. I think that's the joy of all like short, uh, like anthology films is that yeah. there's always that comeuppance or yes. some, somebody gets what they're the their just desserts yeah. at the end. And... Yeah, the Twilight Zone twist. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> One other quick thing on, on Quitter's Inc., uh, you know, maybe Stephen King fans would uh, maybe pick this up, but like in uh, at when James Wood's wife is in the uh, in, in the in the, the electric shock room, the, the music that's playing there um, is 96 Tears, which is a song that sort of like is featured heavily in Hearts in Atlantis, especially toward the end. Oh, there. whoa, really? Yeah, that's it was so interesting because that comes so much later. So much like, later, exactly. But but it, it is also him sort of absorbing um, the time just before this. Or, or like, you know, because Hearts in Atlantis is sort of set after sort of the 60s and Vietnam mm-hmm. and all these things. And the moment of time where the person who's hearing the song is uh, sort of seeing something that may or may not be happening, uh, but is a, a ref, you know, sort of a reflection of the, you know, the the materialism and consumerism of, of the eighties and the, mm. the, the cult of self. Uh, it, it was, it was an interesting little thing. I, I hadn't sort of uh, picked up on as a Stephen King fan. Uh, uh, the past dozen times I'd seen cat's eyes. That's such a great detail too, because you know, hearts of Atlantis is like a four part, like short story sort of anthology. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's and, some long stories and then some shorter ones at the end. Yeah. Right. Okay. And then, and it's part of the, um, dark tower world as are most of Kinda, Stephen King's yeah. books, but it yeah, has yeah, yeah. a story that's right. like very connected to the dark tower. And in the dark tower, you learn that, you know, Stephen King is a part of the series. <laughs> He exists. Spoiler. And like yeah. our, yeah, sorry guys. <laughs> it's been out for 20 years. Yeah. Um, so he, so he does this great job of blurring the Stephen King universe, which he did such a great job of keeping in Castle Rock, right? For so long, this fake mm-hmm. place that he made up. But with the Dark Tower, he blurs it into our world. So I think there's something interesting there with like using the song in Hearts of Atlantis, having mm-hmm. the song be in oh, real right. life in Cat's Eye. And like, you know, who knows if he thinks those types of things through. Sometimes, I mean, he is really into weaving stuff, but it's kind of a yeah. fun thought experiment. Well, and then also, in, if you're talking about Dark Tower stuff, it's like, you know, that's the the OG, like, uh, multiverse mm-hmm. uh, oh, yeah. thing. But music seems to be something that he kind of uses as uh, connectors a lot. I, I know yeah. that there was a track that was a, or discussed in the beginning of The Stand, they changed it in the show or oh, the miniseries. Uh, God, what is it? Um, it was Don't Fear the Reaper in yeah, the show. Yeah, in the show. All right, exactly. Yeah, but they, they, it was McGarris something song. else, and that was kind of like, he even described the music playing at that time, like when everything right. kind of went to shit. I, I thought that was interesting that he makes these like specific choices, you know? He's just a... 
He's yeah, just a very interesting writer. Yeah, and, and it's not by accident. Like, there's no. so many um, ways to read his stories, and then yeah. musically as part of it. Well, one last quick thing on Cat's Eye. Uh, how much did you guys love, at the very beginning of this, we were talking about uh, Evil Dead. How much did you love the sort of Evil Dead shaky cam at the beginning of this, where it was like sort of the <laughs> troll's point of view? Which we oh. didn't know it was the troll yet at the at the beginning, but you hear that <laughs> little, little like breathing as he's you're running into the house. Yeah, that was really interesting too because you're like, wait, is that the cat? Like, what's making right. that noise? Right. Well, well, because they, they kept kind of cutting away to the cat, and they're mm-hmm. just like, you know, be fooling you that it was the cat. But I mean, you know, if if you'd seen it, uh, uh, you know, a dozen times like I have, like you you, you know what that that thing is supposed to be tricky filmmakers well, yeah the <laughs> and the general's so fun it's just pure camp like yeah. it's sort of suspenseful yeah, the, the, the little arm and like the like hamburger meat at the end of that, <laughs> oh my gosh fan you know? i was yes. gonna bring up i mean could you imagine being those parents and walking into the room and seeing just some <laughs> obliterated little creature and, right like that has like a the, human the arms hand? were still in, intact yeah. Yeah. like there were things of it that you're just like that's not human and then that little knife. That <laughs> <laughs> knife is the this best. This is a little strange. Well, I love the way that like Drew Barrymore gets to keep the cat by the mom being like, oh, <laughs> never bring this up in school. And she's like, if you let me keep the cat, I won't. She's like, that's the button. That's blackmail. Yeah. I think that's the button. And they could have they could have ended it there. Even though I like that they teased that the cat might still be evil at the end. But then it yeah. comes up. I think I think that that was the button there. I think they still could have uh, done the cat's breath thing during the credits, you know, but then they had to give the incredible cat's eye themed song uh, sung by Ray Stevens. Uh, (laughs) Right. Yes, they couldn't put any other. That is a jam. That is perfect for a a Halloween playlist. The Cat's Eye song. There you go. Really, it's got all of the synth. Right after the Monster Mash, if you're you're putting it together. Yes, absolutely. (laughs) Yeah, I really, I think this one is so fun. And it's interesting because it's, I think this one's kind of like kid appropriate, where something like Quitters Inc. and The Ledge aren't, like, that's my biggest issue with this is like tonally, they don't quite, Mm. The Ledge sort of goes with Quitters Inc., and quality wise, this one sort of goes with Quitters Inc. But like tonally, this one is way more like, um, are you afraid of the dark kind of to me? Yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah, exactly. Even the creature. Yeah, mm-hmm. like a little yeah. troll like- <laughs> tormenting a yeah. young girl and the cat saving your life. By being a DJ, the cat DJs at the end and like, <laughs> throws the troll into the fan. But I, but I have to admit, the use of, um, you know, large objects to make the troll look miniature yeah. oh, was really well done. Very. Like, it, it, you know, there obviously that would be done with CG now and much simpler, or not simpler, but more uh, cost-effective ways of of doing that on screen with you know some person that's composited down small. But I sell, I, I think it sells more when they're actually in the space with the large right. objects and it's like the giant chair or whatever it is, the giant fan. All that stuff looks a little bit more realistic, and then that scale just really makes it look like that thing is you know this big or however big it was. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. And the way that yeah. like when he comes and goes from the little hole, like you were saying earlier, the effect of the troll going into his little hole in the baseboard is really impressive. And that yeah. idea that like there's something that could be living in your walls and you don't have any yeah. way to track it. Like there's no way to see because he right, can just what's behind the wall. Right. Like, is it, is it another, another world? world that he's going into? Yeah, yeah I know. That's <laughs> what... Is that the multiverse back there? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know. I totally I loved all that. I was like, oh, man, I could do a whole movie. Yeah. Wait, love this. Um, For sure. I thought the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. I really love this one. I think it's very memorable. I think it's a great one to end on too, because it's an uplifting note also. Yeah. That's a good call. Yeah. We don't want to go with it. It's a a little more optimistic than the uh, fire starter (laughs) ending. I mean, even as, uh, as optimistic as they were, they were trying to be, it's like, you set up a pretty (laughs) dark world there. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, She's an orphan. Yeah. And she's got to try to now talk to the New York times about what's happening. Is that, I think that was the last shot we get, right? She's like entering the the newspaper. Yeah. She's going to like tell the newspaper about the government. Like, I don't think things are going to get easier for her at that point. Exactly. (laughs) And that's why we need to tune into Firestarter Rekindled to find out exactly (laughs) what what happened happened to Charlie. Yeah. I, yeah. How do you choose a name like that if you're trying to be serious? <laughs> like, <laughs> you're ruining the tone. 
yeah. just for a little Reaver. joke. You wanted a joke that badly? That's like, again, exactly. not to bring it back to improv, but UCB has uh, owns part of my mind. So, like, the fact that you, inst- you instead of staying yes. grounded, you were like, I want this little joke for myself. Fuck the entire movie that I made. Like, it's so selfish. It's like an improv 101 class. Yeah. Like, I'd exactly. rather be funny well, than I mean, be good. Like, honestly, I mean, I don't think the three of us have seen it. So, so maybe it is a lot funnier than we, we imagined it You're to right. Be. My favorite thing to do is to dunk on something I haven't seen. So <laughs> that's my toxic trait. No, but you, you're, you're probably correct on that. Yeah, I don't think you're going to be too far off. Yeah. Well, because it makes me mad when you when it feels like somebody is titling something for the Internet, where it's like, well, let's see how this plays right, on right. Twitter. It's like, right, right, oh, right. it's so cynical. Clickbait, right? Clickbait. I mean, it's the same yeah. same same idea. Yeah. And it's like I just the antithesis of of King's work. And I just uh, I I want to see him honored, you know, not made a mockery yeah. of <laughs> not that because yeah. like, well, he's he's not much of a sequel writer. Right. Other than Dr. Sleep. Right. Uh, I'm trying to think. I mean, um, and, you know, the 20,000 pages of the Dark Tower that he wrote. He really does this <laughs> interesting thing where he he writes Desperation and the regulators and kind of flips it on its head. Mm-hmm. He did that with The Shining and Pet Cemetery. if you kind of see those as the same story, but flipped on, their, flipped on its head. Um, yeah, but, well, yeah, he's I mean, not done he exploring. He doesn't do a whole lot of sequels. You know? yeah. but, but anybody that can cough out 100 pages a night is is pretty damn impressive, <laughs> in my opinion. Absolutely. I mean, well, yeah. sweats pages. Like, yeah. I don't understand how this guy does this. I mean, in the 80s, it was cocaine, but recently, I think it's talent. <laughs> exactly, yeah. I mean, yeah. You, I, I think that was like the hallucinogens from the shop, right? The coke just kind of unleashed this writer inside <laughs> It was of him, still you know, in like, there, yeah. 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 Well, it he, just kind of cracked that open. He also was a writer before he could afford coke. So it's exactly. It's that thing too. Does, didn't yeah. he say that he doesn't remember writing Carrie? Uh, like it was, Cujo is the one he. Oh, oh. Cooper. He has no idea that he wrote that. Like yeah. that's that's how. He's like, I, I like reading it, but I have no idea. He's who like, wrote it. who wrote this <laughs> who amazing wrote this? story? Well, was it Robert Bachman? It's been, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Richard. Yeah, Richard Bachman. Yeah, it's pretty impressive because uh, that one sort of fits into the Dark Tower universe a little bit too, with like the evil that's floating around mm. town. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. 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 Yeah, there's a exactly. way to sort of tilt all of his books and sort of like a magic eye. You sort of like uh-huh. unfocus your eye and all of <laughs> yeah, them are yeah. a part of the Dark Tower, which I think is a cool it's a trick. It's a sailboat. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's a schooner. <laughs> a schooner is a sailboat, stupid head. Looks like we need a Kevin Smith trilogy here to talk about too one of these days. I will go ham on Kevin Smith. The only thing I <laughs> love sure. more than Halloween and oh, Stephen really? King. I love Kevin wow. Smith. I mean, Is it because you're a clerk in real life? I think oh, yeah. maybe. Yeah, like what came first? Me <laughs> yeah, seeing yeah, clerks exactly. or me being a clerk? I like can't separate my lived experience. I just feel right. like I feel like Kevin Smith is a down dude and like that he never let Hollywood taint him and he's done whatever no. he wanted. All he does is lift up his folks from home and try yeah. to give regular yeah. people chances. He hangs with people at cons. Seems like the nicest guy in the world and he's actively made efforts to be like oh yeah i can be smarter about this and like he wasn't a guy that was like you can't even be funny anymore i have to call people the (laughs) f word you know i have to use the r word he just like was like okay he like grows and doesn't make a whole stink about it he took a journey you know he went you know the the jersey trilogy if you will you you've got those comedies right but then all of a sudden he goes into Dogma. That's an incredibly deep film, you know, that from his history of being a, a Catholic school student, right? <laughs> and then all of a sudden you've got Red State and the one where the guy turned into a Tusk? walrus or whatever. Tusk, yeah. yeah. Like those movies are out of, like they're, they're completely out of, out of bounds. But He's doing exactly what he wants to do. Exactly. He's an independent filmmaker in the purest definition you know? yeah and and lastly he just started a film festival in jersey that he's also judging and is like open oh, wow. to everybody what, and like it's the just, view askew uh, festival or something or? i don't know if he uses view askew as part of the name i'm trying to remember what it's called now but it's for independent filmmakers it's not for large films and to be like i'm doing this for up-and-coming filmmakers and i'm also a diy a platform, filmmaker yeah. I mean, and the fact that it's like, it's not just my name is attached to it, but like me and my people are going to be there. I'm going to watch the films. I'm going to judge the films at the amount of money and success that he has where you could just disappear. Uh, you know, it's mm-hmm. awesome. It's so cool. It's like he's so dedicated to independent filmmaking. He hasn't forgotten where he's come from. 
And hopefully next he'll make a do a Stephen King adaptation and then we can actually talk about it on the show. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Luce, you mentioned that you wanted to uh, throw to some eek mail from your pod. And I'd love for you to uh, take that away if you could. Yes. So on It's Always Halloween, we do mix uh, public history uh, with private history. People write in and tell us stories about their Halloween memories. And for this special crossover episode of It's Always Halloween and Grindhouse Institute, mm-hmm. I had some people write in. Um, to share their Stephen King memories and like their first impressions. So I'd love to kind of go through these and then chat and see if there's anything that kind of resonates with us as well. Okay, so this first one starts, Hello, my first interaction with the work of Stephen King was technically the movie Maximum Overdrive. (laughs) (laughs) Definitely getting a reaction out of me. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) I know. I can't wait to talk about it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> which I saw on cable shortly after it came out, heavily censored, of course. <laughs> <laughs> My mother was not interested in having horror stuff in the house, so scary movie rentals were never an option. My cousins and friends, at least the ones whose homes I could stay the night in, were <laughs> in similar situations. My reading lists were populated by Star Wars-related books and the occasional reread of Tolkien... So horror books were even further outside my bubble. This all changed in middle school when my family moved in with my grandmother and my Aunt Patsy. My parents put our belongings in storage, and we took up residence in Grandma's basement for two years to (laughs) save up for a house of their own. My Aunt Patsy, who worked the graveyard shift during the week. Grandma, graveyard shift. (laughs) I know, this story has everything. (laughs) And uh, Maximum Overdrive comes from trucks, also from Night Shift. Right. I know, there's like a little Stephen King (laughs) bingo card in this letter. (laughs) I think this is all on purpose. Sorry. (laughs) Uh, My Aunt Patsy was always willing to stay up late with me and watch whatever dubious programs might be on HBO or Monster Vision that week. (laughs) So when November 1990 came around, I had an adult with television privilege to grant me access to (laughs) it. Oh. The two-part miniseries was quite the experience for a seventh grader, nearly the (laughs) same age as the story's child protagonists, Mm. just starting to find like-minded friends after a year in my new school. I navigated bullies who may or may not be lurking in parking lots around the root home. It totally left an impression. I can't recall ever having any related nightmares or developing fear of clowns, but it was important uh, in my development, and it enabled me to be the one recounting the show to my friends after school. I got to be the one doing impressions of the murderous Pennywise and making gruesome sound effects. It was a great (laughs) feeling to witness the action firsthand instead of just hearing it from whichever kids snuck downstairs or spent a weekend with their uncle. (laughs) I was now not just a passive listener in the oral history of preteen horror lore, I was a storyteller. So however well King's work is received by critics, fans, or even myself, I will always appreciate how his story about the transition from child to adult was an important turning point in my own adolescence. And that's from Tom. Thanks, Tom. That was a great letter. Wow. Now, did you guys see... It, when it was originally on TV, I wasn't allowed to. Yeah, I, I watched it uh, live, if you will, or in <laughs> real time when it was released. Yeah. Um, yeah, I remember the first half was was very good. And then I remember the second half, I was a little disappointed outside of the uh, the restaurant scene with the little baby chickens and all that. But um, <laughs> that, that movie scared the living hell out of me. But I do want to talk about Maximum Overdrive because I think that that's where the, the letter started, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. Speaking of Stephen King and cocaine. That was Stephen King <laughs> directing on cocaine, right? right. That was, yeah. Like, yeah, exactly. So um, I remember seeing that movie and I, I remember it being just okay. I, I saw a lot of horror movies as a kid and I was like, this one's fine until the one kid gets run over by the steamroller. <laughs> and they actually showed the steamroller go over the kid's head. I was like, that was brutal. Like that, that, that one stuck with me. And that was one of Same. those moments that, yeah, that, that gave me some nightmares, I think. That was fun, too, because you're like, oh, this movie's so silly. I love horror. <laughs> and horror. the music's weird. <laughs> yeah, like horror's so fun. And then it just like all of a sudden got so serious. I was like, <laughs> oh, never mind. Turns it off. Like. <laughs> Yeah, there's some iconic imagery in that, too. The The truck is the Green Goblin from Spider-Man. Yeah. So cool. Just a really odd. And it was kind of Transformers-esque. Um, and then 
the way that all the trucks would line up and the cars would line up at the end because they were possessed by something, right? We don't really know what that was, but that reminded me of uh, the cell when all of the oh. zombies or the people that were <laughs> aff- afflicted by this, you know, sound wave or whatever it was, they all like line up yes. and they all kind of stand around and like it, it just had that same very Stephen King thing about it, you know, like an army's after you now, an army of the undead or now that an army of trucks. That's um, a really good connection. Did you ever see the Eli Roth uh, adaptation of The Cell? I read the book, but I never. No, I never saw. I didn't know. Did he produce or direct that? I think he directed it. Oh, I didn't wow. see that one. But it wasn't a large release. I didn't watch it just because the book is already so violent that that level of violence <laughs> is not. <laughs> violent. I'm like just not interested in watching that much bloodshed. But I really yeah. thought the book was crazy. Like I thought it, it was, was terrifying. Really fun. Yeah. Yeah. And then, I mean, obviously it, uh, that movie always stuck with me. I still have a bit of a fear of clowns, but in the best <laughs> way. Like I, I want clowns. Like that new movie Terrifier 2 that's coming out soon. Or the Terrifier is the new uh, killer clown that, that's out there. He's a great killer space. clown. Oh, yeah. He's very And I love killer clowns from outer space. <laughs> They're making a video game about that game, about that movie. Yeah. Wow. Sign me up. Wow. Yeah. I can't imagine it in anything but 8-bit. It like just doesn't feel like it should be crisp. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's a good point. Jeremy, do you have any connection to it? Uh, Maximum I, I've only read the book for it. I, I've, I've never seen the miniseries. I saw the first movie that just got remade, and I didn't see the second part with Bill Hader and all that. Yeah, I wasn't allowed to watch it, so I watched it yeah. as an adult, and I was just like, yeah, this is fine. Like, I, It didn't hit me the way it hit everybody I, else. Yeah, I, I, I think I like maybe you know, missed it when it was coming around the first time. And then, you know, when I would see the videotape, I was like, you know what, I'm going to read the book first. And it, it took me so long to read the damn book that like, it, like I just never got around to watch the movie. That's <laughs> hilarious. Yeah. I love the book. I mean, it's Absolutely. got that weird child gangbang in it. Yeah. <laughs> that it doesn't even make sense. I've reread the book recently and it still doesn't really make sense, but it's such a small part of it. I feel like the rest of the book, it shows... I think it's like a really interesting way of showing, I don't know, towns that have like a bad vibe that are hateful yeah. places and kind of mm-hmm. coming up with a supernatural reason for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I, and I, I love the detail of how none of them remember any of this stuff. And like mm. that, that, you know. Yep. So the, the way the movies, the, the, at least the most. Unless recent, they stayed in town, unless they stayed in Derry, what, because they all left Derry, they, they forgot. No, all, all of them forgot. And and like not you know, Mike, the, the the person remembering first, I think was Mike. But like they, they all of them were like, "Wait, what did we do? How did this happen?" And like oh. the, the way that the the book is structured, anyway, is like that. You know, you kind of go in bet- you know, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth between kids and adults, kids and adults, kids and adults. And you know, I think the way they break them up, did they break them up in the miniseries this way too? But like in yeah. in, the, in the movie series, they had. All kids in one, I think, and then they did all. That's how it is in the, the TV miniseries. As yeah, well. and the the VHS breaks up perfectly too. And yeah, and doing it that way, like like, kind of ruins the the memory piece of yes. it. Yes, anyway. I agree. I think that's why it doesn't. I don't think the new one really works either. I think it looks cool. It's a lot sure. scarier. But no, I would love to see just the movie where it's. I love the way the book's written is perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Other than the child gangbang. You can leave that part out. <laughs> but I think that it was missing things still, even in the two part movie, when you've got four hours of movie, they still didn't get into like the whole ritual of Chud, which I thought was the coolest part of, mm-hmm. of that story was how yeah. it got so spiritual, like so mm-hmm. deep and cosmic. And, yeah, you know, and cosmic. all of a sudden they're talking Speaking to of a killer giant, clowns from outer space. Yeah. A giant turtle, right? Well, all and the turtle <laughs> is related to the Dark Tower. Dark tower yeah. it, it's right. the good figure in the Dark Tower. And I was like, if anyone would have been trying to make money they would have used this as a launch for dark tower like right. no one has any planning foresight at all <laughs> <laughs> you're right why, why, why would they it's it's, it's uh why would it's they? quarter by quarter that's right um but speaking of the turtle the giant turtle uh i i forgot to mention this in firestarter i was like man who the hell is that guy who's the uh the charlie's doctor in firestarter he was from Never Ending Story, which also had a giant turtle. And he, he's the guy who's like, oh, no, no, we were looking for Atreyu, the mighty warrior. You're oh, a boy. Yes. <laughs> it's an excellent it was, impression. It was killing me. Atreyu the boy. It was killing me. Atreyu the warrior. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was killing me. 
killing me. I was like, who is this guy? That's right. I told because he had he had the weird like yeah, uh, he unicorn had the thing on, in there. Yeah, like sort of like your stegosaurus forehead. Or <laughs> <laughs> Amazing! Uh, wow, good catch. Do, do we have another? Uh, eek? Yeah, yeah. All right, this one starts. Hello, I have two things to share. Once I saw the outside of Stephen King's home in Banger wow. when I was a teenager on vacation with my parents. I was obsessed with the spider web gates. We were being shown around by a friend of the family who lived there. And I remember them saying something about how Stephen King had said that he often scares himself when he's <laughs> writing. And I remember identifying with this. And also thinking how creepy and scary that actually is. Like, is he possessed? (laughs) (laughs) The other thing, one of the most visceral reactions I've ever had to a piece of writing is his short story, The Ledge. It's in the Night Shift anthology, which has a ton of other creepy ass stories, but they're more of his typical fare. Vampires, rats, murderers, etc. The Ledge has none of that. And it fucking ruined me. (laughs) In fact, my hands sweat even as I type this. If you are in any way afraid of heights or claustrophobic, you have been warned. It almost made me throw up. Hopefully this uh, this eek mailer hasn't watched Cat's Eye, huh? Uh, Yeah, I know. I'm excited to hear if she has. Um... One more thing. This is a loose connection, but I read Pet Cemetery when I was a teenager and it disturbed me beyond belief. <laughs> and what's weird is where I grew up in Huntington Beach, we have a pet cemetery. Oh, wow. It, it's called Sea Breeze Pet Cemetery and it's creepy as hell. Is it on a Micmac yeah. burial ground? Uh, let's see. John Wayne's dogs are buried there and some other celebrities' <laughs> pets as well. <laughs> yeah, not They've anymore. since woken up. And, yeah. <laughs> Only temporarily. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But there's also some random stuff like monkeys, birds, and snakes. Oh, wow. There's a cat grave for a cat named Satan, which I think is really cute. <laughs> And then she shares an article about it, which I will post in our show notes and throw up on the Patreon. Uh, And she also showed a pic, a really amazing picture of the Sea Breeze Pet Cemetery. It's very gothic looking. Nice. She says, as kids and teens in Huntington Beach, wait, is that what it was? Yeah, Huntington Beach. It was common for people to make up crazy stories about shit going down in there. Most of it was untrue, I'm sure, but it still scares me. And whenever I drive by it, I get a little chill. (laughs) If you visit, you have to be cool, though, because one thing I think was true that people used to say is if you show up there trying to be stupid, they will throw you out. (laughs) (laughs) I hope you have a good day. Thanks for the podcast. Ashley. Awesome. Oh my gosh. And can you guys see this sign? It's really fun looking. Wow. Oh, well, it's spelled incorrectly. They, they, spelled it, they spelled it the wrong way. Yeah. It's not what <laughs> yeah, it is. How ridiculous. dare they? Cemetery um, with a C. Yeah. That's, that's fantastic. Like Mortal Kombat with a C. <laughs> I love that. Like, I have to go back and read the legend. Maybe it's a better short story than how they adapted it. I'm very curious now mm. that it's like fresh in my I, mind. I bet that could be a real scary story. I mean, that, that yeah. one. You know, some rich guy that's just going to toy with, with, you know, the boyfriend of his ex-wife uh, or whatever that, however wife. that worked out. Current wife. Yeah. yeah, exactly. But that he won't give the divorce to or won't grant the divorce right. to. I, I had a Pet Cemetery uh, thought when, when you brought up Pet Cemetery. That movie, again, ruined me. Uh, there's a lot that ruined me, I'm thinking, of when I look back. <laughs> all at Stephen King related yeah. And it's all Stephen King related. That's yeah. why we love him now. That's the Stockholm Syndrome we were this talking is your, about earlier. Yeah, exactly. This is your mom's fault for putting creepy yeah. on it oh, three no, years old or whatever. Yeah. yeah, that's her fault. Um, I'll let her know. Um, but she... Um, so... That movie was fine. It was it was very scary. There were some scary images. The cat was scary. Little Gage was scary. All that stuff was scary. But then at the very end, when Denise Crosby, uh, the wife of Creed, um, when she comes back, and all of a sudden she's all screwed up, zombified, mm. and all that, and she takes one last stab, and I think the movie then cuts to black with a scream, and you know, obviously nothing is good, or it leaves on a real <laughs> sour note. She was also in Star Trek: The Next Generation around this time. I was a big Star Trek The Next Generation fan, and she was like one of my favorite characters until she got killed off. Seeing her in that role and then all of a sudden a zombie ruined me. It gave me nightmares. Like, that's all I could think about. It was like Tashi Yar is now this like odd zombie. And now I I just felt bad for her, I think, more than anything. 
That's really yeah. cute. <laughs> <laughs> Have you guys ever been to a pet cemetery in real life? What are your thoughts on that? Uh, Never. And uh, yeah, reading the book early on. Uh, <laughs> Well, you guys ready? It's the theme here. Ruined me because I'm not going to any fucking pet cemetery, okay? <laughs> well, I have been to one during the pandemic, the the first part of the pandemic, like the really serious part. Uh, we yeah. didn't know what was going on. My beloved 15 year old cat passed away, oh, and sorry. thank you. I know it sucked. Um, and I wanted to get her cremated so that I could have her ashes. And the only place that was affordable was the pet cemetery in Calabasas. <laughs> so I had to drive to the pet cemetery with this stiff cat in a box in my back seat. Oh. And I was so, the whole time I was, my boyfriend couldn't come. I was alone <laughs> driving from downtown LA to Calabasas, crying on like the 80 <laughs> different highways I had to take to get there. And then you get off the highway and you know, Calabasas is really pretty. It's kind of up by the mountains near Malibu. Mm. And I had to, I kept turning off. I was like, oh, okay, it's this way. Yeah. I'd go down a side street and then there'd be another side street. And then there was a side street on the side street. Like the, the roads kept getting more and more narrow. I kept getting further and down further away road. from yeah. the you beautiful go place. <laughs> yes. And then I was like in an in industrial road. park, which always kind of makes me nervous anyways. And then I'm going past the industrial park and then the road stops and it's just dirt road, and there's a hand printed sign no. that said Pet Cemetery with an arrow. I turn right around. Yeah, yeah. I know. You have to I walk like, up this little hill. Yeah, yeah, right. There's like another sign that says, I'd turn back if I were you. <laughs> Surrender, Dorothy. Yeah, a hand painted sign with a bloody hand print on it. Yeah, <laughs> so then I, I was free. So I'm following this dirt road, and the whole time I'm like, don't be unreasonable. Like, this is a regular thing. They have a website like that's not everything isn't Stephen King. <laughs> and finally, the road opens up and it's this beautiful rolling hills, this really fancy looking cemetery. But I would wow. say for about five to ten minutes, I was petrified. <laughs> and I'm like, why is it like this? Don't they know what their yeah. reputation is? This is irresponsible. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I, their, their little uh, place where they incinerate, uh, they, you know, do the ashes thing. <laughs> I had to hop on a golf cart with a guy because it's at the end of the cemetery oh. And ride with my cat in a box to the incinerator. <laughs> and I was like, how long is it going to be? And he was like, oh, probably like 10 to 20 minutes. Just depends. And then he says, I think it's best if you stand like downwind <laughs> or like go to this part of the set. Walk oh around, God. enjoy the views. You should stand like make sure you don't go this way. Go that way. And I was like, or and he's like, well, there there'll be a smell. And I was just like, <laughs> at that point, I started filming him because not I was behind him. I was really, I just wanted to get his voice, you know, because it was so funny. I'd been through so much at that point. It was such an insane day, and I was like, to me, it was like the most darkly comedic thing. Sure. That yeah. here I am trying to have a nice day, my last moment with my pet, and it's like you might smell her burning up <laughs> yeah. if you stand too close. It's like three, four. Here should be Judith Myers right here. Oh, kids. Why do they do it? Why do they do it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> He's home. <laughs> He's come home. <laughs> so I'm just wandering around this pet cemetery looking at people's like dead that pigs and rats and like Ashley was saying here, all kinds of odd animals that people bury, right. which is really sweet. But then me just trying to like pay attention to like directions, like, oh, I shouldn't walk too far that way. You know, like yeah. slightly yeah. terrified that I'm gonna catch a whiff. Um, but yeah, Pet Cemetery in Calabasas. They had the best deal on <laughs> cremating my pet, and they gave me a little heart, uh, plaster heart with her little paw print in it, which was oh, really nice. Yeah. So, um, scary drive, uh, colorful staff, but a nice experience overall. Nice. <laughs> yeah. That, that was your Yelp Four review. Four out of five stars on Yelp. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, it's my Yelp review. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Well, I have I have one more. Are you guys up for one more? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I want to do this one because it's also uh about night shift, which I think is nice. really fun that two people wrote in about night shift. And I well, I have the three, original actually like all, all three then cuz like everyone's kind of mentioned some night shift stuff. We had the ledge and then uh you know trucks and uh, Oh yeah, cuz maximum overdrive a short story 
Yeah, trucks. Was that what graveyard was the name shift? Of the, the oh, truck story. trucks yeah. was in night shift. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Is it night shift or graveyard shift? Graveyard shift is a short story. Night in night shift. Night okay. surf is also a short story, and then night shift is the the collection of short stories. And graveyard shift was the big bat, right? Uh, in grave in the in the story, it was it was giant rats, I think. But yeah, yeah. Ah. I think in the movie with the. Very crazy, like yeah, minor helmet and the the skull eye or whatever. Yeah, I think yeah, it, I love that it, cover. They, they That's great cover. such a good cover. Speaking yeah. of like video store covers that exactly you know, draw you in, yeah, that one will draw you in because that movie's not that great. But that <laughs> cover is awesome. Yeah. The cover is awesome. It reminds me of the two other ones that were similar. Popcorn, also. Oh yeah. <laughs> It's sort of a disturbing skull Come with a bag, cover. go home in a box. <laughs> yes. Oh, my gosh. Such a great tagline. I love that you know it. Yeah. And then the um, Dead Alive with the girls oh, yeah. with uh, the skull in her mouth. In yeah. Her mouth, yeah. That yeah. really freaked me out a lot. Um, <laughs> I, I see the three of those all kind of together as like a trilogy of upsetting VHSes. <laughs> <laughs> for me, it was always the, the cover art for People Under the Stairs. Oh, that that's me. a good As one. A yeah, that makes sense. And then just the idea that there's anyone under your stairs. Yeah, just, yeah. <laughs> it's a bad concept. Especially if you grow up in the Midwest and there are certain spaces under the stairs. Yeah, yeah exactly. crawl spaces. Absolutely. All right. Hello. My earliest memory of and first introduction to Stephen King was a serendipitously spooky encounter followed by many sleepless nights. <laughs> <laughs> When I was around Same. 10 years old, Keep going. Yeah, yeah, I know, right? I'm like, wow, that's all of us. That's what yeah. I love about Stephen King, though. It's <laughs> it's like not just our relationship with the work, but how it builds yeah. a community with people. Uh, when I was around 10 years old, my dad took me to a dinner party at one of his friend's houses. As I recall, I was the only child there and got bored very quickly after we ate. So I roamed through the house and found a small office with a bookcase crammed full of books. I scanned the books and read the spines to see if I could find something interesting when I noticed Night Shift by Stephen King on the shelf. I eagerly pulled it down and started reading immediately. The foreword gave me chills, but I read on and I was mesmerized by the first short story, Jerusalem's Lot. (laughs) When it was time to leave the dinner party, my dad's friend said I could borrow the book and returned it when I finished. My mom was not happy about this. (laughs) (laughs) Why the cover alone didn't frighten me enough to immediately reshelve the book, I'll never know. What I do know is I didn't sleep well for a week after reading that first story, and I slept terribly for a few months after reading the rest of the collection. The stories that haunted me the most were Sometimes They Come Back, Mm. The Lawnmower Man, Quitters, Inc., and... Despite being so scared, I was hooked and enthralled with his macabre, dark, and creepy visions of humanity, or lack thereof, depending on your perspective. (laughs) And I'm still hooked to this day. His works sometimes fall flat when adapted for other media, though I don't think that's due to his writing style or the stories themselves. You really can't go wrong. Never judge a book by its movie. (laughs) Oh my God. That's, I want a shirt. (laughs) That says that in like Stephen King font, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Um, okay. You really can't go wrong with reading his early works and his canon as a whole is remarkable. Stumbling across this seminal collection led me down a lifelong path of loving to read about things that go bump in the night and unassuming plunges into mysterious, unexplainable quivers and shivers. Thank you for that, Stephen King. In closing, I finally caught up on all your shows after finding your podcast earlier this summer. Thank you for sharing your passion, education, and welcoming us all into the fold. Uh, Keep working your magic. Your love of Halloween is contagious in all of the best possible ways. Eerily yours, Heather. Oh, the cute little review at the end. Thanks, Heather. (laughs) I I started reading before I realized that that was just a shout out to myself, but... (laughs) Is the night well shift deserved. cover uh, that she was referring to the, with the hand and the eyeballs? Yes, uh, the paperback so version of good. it is. Yeah, I don't oh, okay. remember what the hardback cover looks uh, hardback, like. Hardback, it, 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 it's just uh, it, it's like a kind of a '70s font, and it's, it's kind of a 
Oh yeah, like a red border, and there's like some blood coming down at the at the bottom. But okay, yeah. nice. Well, I actually have this is the copy of Night Shift that I have. I'm very proud of owning the, it. The um, the oh, hands God. with the eyeballs. I am the doorway, uh, mm-hmm. like a painting on the front. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that crazy though? That three people who wrote in yes. were writing in about Night Shift and about Cat's Eyes, and I don't think I said that we were even talking about Cat's yeah. Eye when I did a call for Stephen King letters. So Cat's Eye is the right movie then? For yeah. You. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. It, speaking of the multiverse, yeah, like it was all. Uh, all things follow the beam, I guess. Yeah, we are um, all part of Stephen King's <laughs> car. Yeah, no, that that was awesome, and uh, and you know, same. I like that wasn't the first book of his I read, but um, it's definitely one that I come back to a, a whole lot. And you know, there's a lot of classic ones, and and a, an amazing number of them have been made into to movies, or, or at least <laughs> into TV shows or movies. Sometimes they come back. The Lawnmower Man, mm-hmm. Children of the Corn, the very first uh, Stephen King adaptation that Frank Darabont did, The Woman in the Room. Mm. Um, also, I have to shout out uh, my brother and uh, friend of the show, Michael Floyd's uh, you know, short film, One for the Road, that just played at the Stephen King Rules uh, Dollar Babies Film Fest uh, a couple weeks so ago. So cool. Oh, that's fantastic. I want to do one story. of those. Oh, yeah. That's like my dream is to do. Oh, I, I've never been able to narrow down. I'm like, and for this story, I would do this. <laughs> and so I'm just kind of waiting for one to call to me. And then well, I'll e- know it's time to email make them because they, they have a specific list now. It's, it's not just any short story anymore. Oh, OK. That's really good to know. Because I think some of them have, um, uh, you know, have already been you know adapted or, or like, you know, been, been signed away as, as, as like exclusive rights for. Right. You know, corporate things. Corporate things. Um, were you guys allowed, so you were allowed to watch anything, it sounds like, Brian. Was that- yeah, I mean, my mom would probably hate me saying that on the show because she was a very good parent, I promise. But uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't she- mean it in a judgmental <laughs> yeah, way, no, but I- <laughs> she, was per- she was permissive in a specific sort of way. Yeah, she- I think she felt like I, I, I wasn't, you know, letting it get to me too much other than nightmares and things like that. But that's kind of, you know, par for the course or, you know, what comes along with it. But no, yeah, I watched a lot of this stuff mostly when right when it came out, you know, like I was probably five, six years old when, when these movies wow. were released, you know? Yeah. And, and Jeremy, were you watching it? Like, when did you start reading Stephen King? Cause I was about 14. My first book that I read was Carrie mm-hmm. and I kind of went in order cause I was a huge nerd. So I wanted to do it chronologically. <laughs> yeah. I was like 10 or 11 and I, the first one I read was Cujo mm. and yeah, I, my, my parents uh, didn't like me watching horror movies a whole lot which is funny because my younger brother uh the <laughs> one who made one for the road uh is is a huge huge horror junkie uh and you know he i i kind of got into some horror stuff through him but stephen king um yeah i started reading about like 10 or 11 years old and yeah like it was cujo and then you know like maybe rose matter i read and then um then i started to kind of go back and do like you know carrie Salem's Lot to Shining and kind of try to do it chronologically, more or less. I'm curious if you guys have ever done any Stephen King characters as Halloween costumes before. Oh, because mm, I, yes. my college boyfriend and I were Wendy and Jack Torrance oh, one wow. year. That's a great costume. <laughs> and yeah. that was really, really fun. We hosted a Halloween party at our house. So it was great. We got to be like, welcome Let's to the Overlook the Hotel. Cat to Sidewinder. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> no, I don't think I ever dressed up as, a, as any of the characters. I, um, it would be interesting, though, to, to kind of mine that a little bit because there's some cool cool folks in there yeah yeah a lot of visually interesting stuff what about you jeremy oh man i I, like honestly the whole time you guys were talking i was like okay think of any (laughs) halloween costumes you ever had on i was like i don't even know i don't even remember (laughs) (laughs) you don't remember anything you've ever dressed up as (laughs) basically no (laughs) i mean i i get it it is my job to regularly think about my whole life and as it relates to halloween so (laughs) (laughs) i can pull every year every costume out pretty quickly well, but I do yeah. think it's interesting. I think like a Stephen King themed Halloween party would be super fun. Yeah. Because there's yeah. so much to choose from. And, you know, you could have so many there's, you know, he talks so much about music. And he talks so much about food, all these little details you can pull from his books and do like theme out the entire thing. Yeah. Yeah. 
That's a free gift I'm giving to our listeners yeah. <laughs> uh, because I don't yeah, have the time. Yeah, we didn't have to pay for this to... one on Patreon. Yeah, exactly. This is a perfect idea. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. But I, I just think there isn't enough. Like people love Stephen King, but I feel like there's so many more. Like it's always his big ones, you know. But there's yeah. so much to mine in these short stories, yeah. and it's really fascinating to me to hear three different people, totally separate from each other, write in that this specific collection of stories like jarred them. Here, here, here's here's a free one. Here we go. So you can do a crossover with Stephen King and John Carpenter, mm. and have uh, a Snake Plissken like outfit <laughs> with a gray ponytail, and you can be like, "Call me Scott," because in Firestarter, his one messed up eye, he puts on an eye patch call toward me, the end. Call me Rainbird. <laughs> That's call right. Me he does have that eye patch on at the end. Yeah. What a deep cut that would be. <laughs> Snake Rainbird? Yeah, 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 right. Exactly. I was trying to think of what that would be. John Snakebird? <laughs> John Snakebird. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, like, you, you, the characters, though, it's interesting because the characters are so grounded that, you know, like even Drew Barrymore... You, you know, oh, I'm I'm Drew Barrymore from Firestar. Yeah. Well, oh, I've got a you flannel can, like, on, and I yeah, you yeah, the hair. Yeah. You can spray yeah. have have hairspray your hair up. You'd have to have, have, have a little fan, fan on, on your chest, back. exactly. Yeah, <laughs> uh, you could do like um, I don't know, like little fire, or you could like do a couple's costume and have the person you're with just like be off just fire, <laughs> oh, and you could awesome. stand next to them, or, or have that person like be that. The, the, yeah, the the meteor fire. <laughs> yes, <laughs> they're just like a comet. That would be a fantastic costume. I mean, from Cat's Eye, the troll would be a really great oh my God. costume. <laughs> I wonder if anyone would catch that one. Well, if they were at a Stephen King party, for sure. But I yeah, mean, I think. so my, my other toxic trait is purposely picking hard to <laughs> distinguish Halloween <laughs> costumes and then getting mad at everybody for not recognizing yeah. it. I like fall into this trap every year. <laughs> Why don't you get my, my pun costume? <laughs> yeah. This is a super deep cut. Yeah. It's always a specific character and then it's like my opportunity to be like, oh, this whole party is filled with rubes. <laughs> yeah. No one has any culture or taste. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's a like, way for you to, to remain party, superior Lisa. everywhere yeah. you go. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I'm like that, but then it always <laughs> happens. Uh, I'm working on it. I just get, you know, every year there's a a popular movie that everybody wants to dress as. And mm-hmm. so I'm like, I can't do something yeah. that's that popular. That's the one thing I won't do. Exactly. <laughs> And so inevitably it's like, oh, you never read One for the Road by Stephen <laughs> King. You didn't know about the Salem Slot multiverse? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm the giant turtle at the end of it, the book, yeah. and also the Dark Tower series. And possibly the never ending story. You never know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it connects. <laughs> Well, I would love to hear from uh, Grindhouse Institute listeners, who I assume are now going to become It's Always Halloween listeners. Uh, I would love to hear like what Stephen King costumes that people have dressed up as or or see pictures. You know, a lot of times people send in really great pictures. We also have a we have a Halloween coming out of costumes of people's 80s and 90s and 70s Halloween costumes that listeners have sent in that I'm really excited. We're going to have ready soon for pre-order. But I'm just obsessed with seeing people's Halloween costumes. I think it's so fun. So if anybody has anything Stephen King related, uh, please send it in to the podcast. It's always Halloween podcast at gmail.com. I want to hear from everybody. (laughs) All my new fans, all my new Grindhouse fans. Um, well, I was just going to thank real quick. Uh, thank you, Heather and Tom and Ashley for writing in. I think that was like a perfect little bow on our film discussion. Yes, thank you. I can't believe how that lined up so perfectly. I can't either. Yeah. And I didn't. <laughs> it's wonderful. I just scanned them to make sure that they were fun, but I didn't really read them very closely ahead of time. So I didn't know going in that these were going to be so perfect. So you guys rule. Thank you. <laughs> well, Luce, well, thank, thank you. you so much for joining us uh, today. Can you, uh, again, remind everyone where where they can follow you and find you? Yes, for sure. So my uh, all of my like film stuff and comedy stuff and uh, all the other podcasts I guess on, you can find 
find all that stuff on my uh, LTB comedy. That's LTB comedy. Those are my initials, Luce Tomlin Brenner. Uh, so I'm LTB comedy on Instagram and on Twitter. And then for It's Always Halloween, where It's Always Halloween podcast on Instagram, uh, you can also find the podcast wherever you get podcasts. I also have the Patreon, <laughs> patreon.com slash It's Always Halloween. And I screen this month. It's Stephen King's birthday, September 20. First, he's going to be 75. Wow. I know. And I think that means we still get him for like hopefully 20 more years. Yeah. Um, Don't jinx and it over here, okay? I know. Oh, yeah. okay, okay, I'm knocking. <laughs> um, but we're celebrating him the whole month on Patreon, and I'm going to be screening a ton of his films, uh, reading a couple of his short stories for bonus episodes, and we're going to be reading Carrie in our book club. Nice. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> book. Uh, yeah, so I'm really excited about that because I'm gonna we're going to read Carrie. Carrie, and then Get I'm your gonna dirty do... pillows ready. Oh, <laughs> bring those dirty pillows up, ladies. <laughs> um, we're going to read it, and then we're going to watch the Brian De Palma 76 version, nice. and then a double feature it with the Kimberly Pierce uh, 2013 version, and have a fun kind of discussion about the difference between the two directors and like kind of the difference of the adaptation. And oh, so it's going to get really nerdy yeah. if you guys are into this adaptation talk. Come oh, visit me. On I'd, I'd like to throw it out there that Carrie is the first. Uh, American Giallo film, and it feels mm. like an Italian horror film. Ooh, interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. What do you have? Any other uh, little points that you want to make in favor of that? <laughs> well, that sounds like a challenge. You're throwing on the gauntlet there. <laughs> I'd say the color kind of reminds me of uh, Suspiria. Totally. I feel like the um, yeah, and I guess the prom is it scene Piper too, Piper yeah. Laurie? Is mm -hmm. that her name? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the I mom. feel like Piper Laurie feels like a lot of the Argento villainous women. Yes, in, in his religious in his hysteria. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. A lot of religious imagery. Yeah, and I think definitely, especially we, we were talking about Sergio Martino, and it, he explores the you know women's psyche a lot. All Jalo does, but like his films are all about like, am I crazy or is it everyone else who is crazy? <laughs> and that's very much kind of what Carrie's about, and that's kind of my favorite genre of film is like women pushed to the brink of madness by an uncaring yeah. society like i Speaking can't get of enough Shirley jackson and yeah exactly that that whole yeah and we're doing shirley jackson themed in december so oh, perfect people like that we've got some fun stuff coming up december that's not halloween oh wait it's always it's halloween. always <laughs> halloween oh my god that was fantastic jeremy thank you so much can't get enough um but yeah i'm everywhere on the internet so come come hang out with me i love talking about films come to video tech if you're in uh, the la area we're open seven days a week and we've got more films than you can spin a dead troll on a record player <laughs> at. Go. You know that old phrase, that old yeah. chestnut? <laughs> that old chestnut from the sea. <laughs> the idiom that we all know and love, yeah. We're starting it. It's yeah. happening. <laughs> Thank you again. This was uh, this was absolutely incredible. Uh, great to have guests on, especially guests that are so passionate about uh, movies and can really handle the discussion and everything. It was really, really oh, great Oh, thank you. you. I really appreciate the invite. It was super great to, I mean, just how much you guys love Stephen King is so nice because I just hate when I'm listening to a <laughs> podcast and I feel like they're not passionate <laughs> about it at all. It drives me crazy. So yeah. yeah, thank you for getting into it with me, guys. This was so much fun and I, I don't want to go. I could do this for hours. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was awesome. Thanks so much for joining thank us. Thank you very much. Dearest Lanterns, I hope you enjoyed our very first crossover episode. I would love to hear more of your Stephen King memories and share what types of books scare you the most by calling in to the All Hallows hotline at 802-532-DEAD or write us at yeek mail at it's always Halloween podcast at gmail.com. As I said at the top of the episode, if you love It's Always Halloween, please subscribe at patreon.com slash it's always Halloween or make a one-time donation using our tip jar. You can also support the podcast by buying It's Always Halloween merch on Redbubble. Those links, along with our Instagram, can be found in our show notes. This episode of It's Always Halloween was performed and researched by me, as well as the boys over at the Grindhouse Institute, Brian Foster and Jeremy Floyd. The meat of this episode was edited by Jeremy and Brian, 
Our opening and outro today was edited with sound design and theme music by the incredible Pete Burns. Thank you, Pete. You can follow me on Instagram and Twitter at LTB Comedy and Pete at Mittenberries. If you're on Apple Podcasts, please subscribe and write us a little review so that other like-minded lanterns can find us. We got a couple of really nice ones this week. It's been such a pleasure to read. I love knowing how much Halloween joy we're spreading here. This review is from Mandykins23 with the subject line, Love This Podcast. I look forward to a new episode every Friday. This podcast is hands down my favorite to listen to, well-researched and very thoughtful. Luce is a phenomenal storyteller and a great host. This podcast makes me absolutely excited down to the marrow in my bones. That's so lovely to hear. Thank you, Mandykins. We work very hard to delight your bone marrow, so I am happy it is working. We are everywhere you listen to podcasts, including the NPR One app, where you can subscribe and tell Ira Glass that you love us. Thank you so much for listening to yet another episode of It's Always Halloween. And come back next time, unless you get locked into a battle of wits with a bloodthirsty troll and a protective tabby cat. <laughs>